Three board to order. Uh, we'll start with uh, the approval of the agenda. You have the agenda before you. Are there any uh, questions or concerns about the agenda? If not, thank you. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The agenda is approved. We'll move to our public invitation. If there's anyone, members of the public, interested in uh, addressing the Transit Advisory Board today? I don't see anyone jumping up and down, and since we're all at the table, we'll move on to the next thing. <laughs> all right, uh, we're going to do our um, tab chairs report. As you can see, the chair isn't here, and neither is the vice chair, so the second vice got to sit at the table today. Um, but I will uh, just make note, Chair Hovland wanted to remind everyone that our April 17th tab meeting will likely run long, and so we just want you to adjust your schedules that it will go until 3 o'clock. There's a lot of information at the April meeting, uh, so just an early heads up on that. With that, we'll move to our agency report uh, and start with Michael Barnes from MnDOT. All right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a, a few items. One, uh, an update on uh, the safety TZD side of things. Um, year to date, uh, we have 36 fatalities. As I say, it's 36 more than we should have, but it is less than the 55 we had last year. So it's, it's about a third, a little over a third less, which is a good trend, but still very early in the year. You know, it's one thing with the, the weather that we've been having actually does... Um, actually lower the fatality side of things. Um, and then now with the potholes, that slows things down also, which I'm just mentioning we do, we are aware there are, you know, we have a website that you can re report in any potholes. We do have crews, if they're not plowing, they are filling potholes and we do have contracts that we're trying to get the hot mix as soon as we possibly can to, to Mac to have actual fixes that are a little bit longer than the cold mix that that we, uh, we have to use in the winter time. And so then also then, you know, we have our uh, construction kickoff coming, coming up soon. So we're gonna go right from snow potholes right to the construction season. So um, unless there's questions, that's all that I have, Madam Chair. We could just reframe potholes to traffic calming measures and uh, it's a <laughs> then good We are calming strategy. traffic, but not people's nerves. I, can, <laughs> and I know by <laughs> emails that I get and I learn new uh, language every day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll move on to uh, MPCA <laughs> report. Todd Buin. Thank you, Madam Chair. You um, nothing to report from MPCA today. Wow. Any questions for the MPCA? That has nothing to report. All right, you're off the hook. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Mac, uh, Carl Crimmins. Now, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a few things. First off, I want to start with the best. Uh, the MSP was voted best airport in the 40 million passenger category again. This is the second year in a row and the sixth year out of seven. The only year we didn't win was COVID was 2020. And we didn't take surveys in 2020, so we didn't submit ourselves. So that's <clears throat> six out of seven years. Uh, the Ma MSP has just joined Greater MSP in their M Bold initiative that includes recycling of food packaging, pallet wrap, single use plastic bags, etc. And we're also going to now try to use products made from recycled product, plastic, promoting a circular economy. So that's starting to pick up. We have a, naturally, we have a lot of waste at the airport with the concessions and everything else. We had a crash at Flying Cloud Airport on Tuesday, I believe it was. Three people in the plane, they all survived. It was a single plane, they crashed just west of the airport. So the FAA is investigating. We think there might have been something wrong with the plane and they came down a little too soon. Uh, 2022. The top 20 busiest days at MSP happen to be during spring break, which is now. Airlines have now scheduled 410,000 seats per week for people traveling. But this will go on to the first week of April. Spring break will carry through to the first week, the second week of April. Uh, people should be aware that parking demand is going to be high. Mm -hmm. So not only traffic demand getting to and from the airport, getting through security at the airport, but also parking. So you should schedule accordingly. And passengers should plan on arriving two hours early for domestic flights, 
three hours for international flights. But we recommend and to remind everybody to regularly check your flight status with their airlines. There's no guarantees here the way things are going. Everything's running smooth right now, but there's no reason to think there might not be a computer glitch down the road. But that's all we have right now. Everything so far uh, going through security is running pretty smooth. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Great. No potholes at the airport? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Better, not have with a, you member Barnes. Better not have a, a pothole on the runway. No. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Any questions for Member Crimmins? Um, we're going to go to uh, Deb Barber from the Met Council. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will also try and keep it short today. Um, one big thing is we have a new council that got seated as of last Wednesday. So there are seven new council members. And on Transportation Committee, we have a lot of turnover. There is five of nine are new council members, and one is a council member um, that um, moved over from another committee. We need more, some more east side representation, so we, we made that happen. Um, and um, we had our first um, actual committee meeting with them on Monday, and I thought it went very well. A lot of great questions, a lot of good dialogue. Um, but we'll um, keep you posted on some of that. Um, also, um, you've heard us talk about our safety and security action plan, which is sort of the broad-based approach of how we're going to start addressing or keep addressing uh, the safety and security concerns on the transit system. Uh, we have an effort going through right now that we're looking at um, of putting some private security guards um, at specific stations. Those stations account for about 20% of our calls. Um, so initially, it was at Franklin and Lake Street. Um, is where we had um, and their um, uniformed um, or uniform security services is what they are and they were at Lake Street and Franklin we're also going to start deploying um, people to um, Brooklyn Center Transit Station Central Station Uptown Transit Center and Chicago Lake Transit Center uh, right now it's a contract that um, is, is a two-year contract but can be executed year by year so we can see if, if it's working or if it's not and adapt um, especially as we hopefully start filling out our police um, uh, officers as well. Um, and then we continue to have our TPP listening sessions. Um, I know that um, we had one with TAB members, but also several of the counties are having them. So um, if you get an opportunity, please participate. We're trying to be more upfront early on with some of this process. So um, as many voices at the table would be um, very helpful. And with that, I will pause for questions. Yes, uh, Member Foster. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question about the security company that's being contracted with. Um, there was an article this morning about some fairly unethical and scary incidents that they have had in other cities and transit agencies. How is that being considered? It is definitely being considered. I also okay. saw that article. So uh, there are plenty of questions being being asked. I do think it's a service that we do want out there as an as a piece of it. You yes. know, there's so many different elements to this, as you know too well, um, as a, an active writer. Um, but yeah, we're, we'll definitely make sure that we are looking into that and have the right language in our contracts to address anything. Okay. Great. Thank you, Member Ulrich. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm wondering if occasionally we could have a uh, legislative update, uh, Met Council legislative update from Judge Shetland. Um, I think it'd be very interesting, very helpful, very informative uh, if he would give us an update on transit transportation issues um, when the session is, legislature's in session. I, I think that would be a good thing. He's over the years been here occasionally, but I, it'd be good to see him a little more regularly. And if we could get that kind of update, that would be, I think, excellent. Yeah. Oh. Try to arrange it for, for our next month. So I know it's just like with everyone, I think it's been a, a different kind of pace for the session. So um, I think typically we probably would have seen Jed by now, but that's yeah. likely. But I'll talk to him and see if we can get him here next time. Thank you, Member Barber. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, then we'll move on to the STA. Gary Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can say generally that the suburban providers are seeing consistent ridership to, uh, to slow growth. Um, individually for each, Maple Grove is uh, exploring increasing its number of EV chargers installed at stations and park and rides uh, for riders. Plymouth is exploring further um, opportunities for route uh, interconnectivity with Maple Grove as the uh, initial uh, connections have proven to be quite successful. Southwest Transit, uh, their micro uh, transit partnership with Lyft has been approved and they're moving forward on technical integration. 
And uh, MVTA's EGEST uh, electric minibus demonstration is ongoing uh, with no major issues. The vehicle was uh, in service during one of our many storms in February and had no problems. So it looks like it's got good possibilities. Great. Yeah, Member Alrick. You're going to hear a, a term, uh, I think it's going to be over and over repeated, and it's going to grow in its importance, and that's the word microtransit. Mm -hmm. uh, well. And uh, it's piqued the interest of the key legislative leaders in, in transportation, and it's being uh, piloted in uh, some of the Suburban Transit Association. I know um, Metro Transit has some microtransit going as well. I, I would suggest that we put that on a topic for to uh, growth topic, learning topic for the future for the tab to, to get a full presentation, maybe involving STA and also Metro Transit uh, to get a full picture of what that looks like. All right, thank you. We've added it to the list. Any other comments or questions? Mm -hmm. All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the TAC report. Um, we are welcoming Michael Thompson, TAC like us. Of, uh, we're going down the line of different folks, so we have a new presenter today. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I'm Michael Thompson. I'm the Public Works Director for Plymouth, so a Metro City's appointee and the Chair of Funding and Programming. Um, I'm third string today because Brian and Jenny couldn't make it, so no hard questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, uh, we did review four streamlined TIP amendments, there's four project changes were fairly minor. Three were MnDOT cost changes or project length adjustments. And then also Hennepin County had a minor adjustment. And also that was passed unanimously. And then also a streamlined for the Chisago County US 8 project because it extends into Washington County. So it is in the STIP. Oh, there you go. Thank you. I'm a rookie here. Um, it is in the STIP, but needs to move, be moved to the TIP, um, so that also passed unanimously. Um, we did also talk about the UPWP, which I can um, briefly touch on when that comes up under non-consent. And then we did spend a majority of our time on the informational item, so the uh, regional solicitation and how safety measures could maybe be enhanced in some of the different categories. So actually, tomorrow we have a funding and programming meeting where we'll probably dive into the detail just because of our tight timeline, it would be good to hear from TAB any direction on that. Um, maybe safety adjustments to all modal categories or certain categories, uh, but there was a good discussion of not taking points away from any other category and putting it into safety. That could be a tough fight, but rather um, adding safety to some of the categories. Um, and then, of course, we heard from uh, Mr. Harrington um, on his informational item. But that is all I have and can stand for questions. Any questions? We're gonna, everyone's going to be gentle with you today. Thanks for coming in and presenting. Uh, great. Thank you. And we got the pre-warning order for a conversation that you'll be looking for direction on the scoring that we'll get to later. So thank you for that. All right, next up is the approval of the minutes from February 15th. I uh, suspect you've had a chance to look at them. I'll move approval. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Excellent, now we'll move to our consent uh, agenda. We have two items on the consent, consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 The same sign. Great. Now we'll move back to our non-consent items and back to Michael. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, one of the action items was the uh, 2023 UPWP. Uh, just quickly, the program is prepared annually and describes the transportation planning activities to be undertaken by the Met Council, the PCA, and MAC. Um, it's also approved by TAB and Council Committee several months before the start of the new calendar year. Amendments to this uh, UPWP are recommended because of unforeseen staffing challenges and delays in 2022, resulting in work that needs to be carried into this year. So the amendment adjusts the timelines and budgets of the work being moved into this year, and it introduces two new studies 
and also adjustments to budgets. As you can see in the packet, it adds $316,000 to the 2023 consultant studies budget. Um, but as I mentioned before, this did pass with unanimous approval at TAC. Excellent. Any questions for Michael? Yes, uh, go ahead, Member Holberg. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I'm <coughs> specifically referencing the electric vehicle uh, study with the engagement and city. And it seems that continually when we see these reports, there's a lack of business community involvement. And I think they're interested in this issue and, in fact, would be in many cases willing to put up their money and space, whether it's hotels or, I mean, there's some, there's some real segments of the business community and I, they don't seem to be included at all in this uh, report. And I'm wondering if there's a reason for that or if it's too late to amend it, but I think we're missing an opportunity. And then there was a lot of discussion around light vehicle charging and again we have a lot of businesses that deploy a lot of vehicles in the course of their uh, business as well and i'm curious why we don't start getting them involved in the planning and involvement process yes thank you madam chair great great points there um, with those specifics i might refer to the the technical staff to answer that madam chair Um, good afternoon, David Burns, planning analyst with the council. Happy to be here. Um, so actually the UPWP doesn't really get that specific in the what we're going to do in the specific consultant studies. We can add that component to the electric vehicle charging study um, if that's something that you would like to see happen. Um, certainly um, this is just kind of a broad overview of the you know, the general what we're trying to do with the study and details like that will be added when we actually publish and um, put the study out for for RFB. Great. I'm hearing you'd yeah. like it added. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, but, but when you, even when you look at these goals, they, it's all about the public charging network. Yep. And there should be a private charging mm -hmm. network in the interaction of those two and cost savings and efficiencies should not be an afterthought in my mind. It should be a forethought in the development yeah. of how this moves. So, okay. you know, I mean, I, I get why you can, I, I get that you can add components when you go out for your RFP, et cetera. But when you look at how this is identified as the goals and outlines and the word business and private don't even appear anywhere in the implementation language. I think it's a real missed opportunity. No, um, thank you very much for that feedback. And um, our project managers will definitely keep that in mind as we move forward through the RFP process. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Commander, Member Thank Kermit. you, Madam Chair. Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious, how is this study working with Xcel Energy's plan for EVs? Are they two being put together? Are they independent of each other? We're, we're phoning a friend for an answer. We'll follow up with you on an answer <laughs> for that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not totally familiar with every study in here. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. All right. With that, I will entertain a motion. So moved. Thank you. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same side. All right, motion carries. Who's second? Uh, who's second? Who's second? Who's second to that? I'm sorry, I heard it. There we go. Okay. Nice. Okay, All right, um, so next up is our information items. Uh, potential changes for the 2024 regional so solicitation. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Making good progress on this meeting so far. Got two information items before you uh, on the agenda. So there, there was two items um, attached to the agenda. One was this PowerPoint. Uh, number two was the scoring attachment form, and that's kind of a nice cheat sheet in my mind. 
you can uh, just a few pages see where the points are being allocated across all the different application types and by mode. So um, we'll, specifically on this first issue item, I um, want to make sure people have this, this uh, close and we can pull it up too and zoom in if we need to. Uh, so again, talking about the 2024 regional solicitation cycle, last month uh, we had a good discussion on it. Again, we talked about advancing the schedule four months, um, having um, rather minimal changes this application cycle to focus on the 2026 cycle. And again, we're going to start that larger consultant study this summer, so it's right on our heels, um, talking about the 2026 cycle. So that's why we're trying to uh, get 2024 um, out the door here from an application standpoint. And you can see we'll be back uh, beyond this month. Next month will be an information item. And then uh, the following month will be an action item. And we'll be ask, asking this group to um, recommend approval of the application uh, in its entirety uh, with changes to it. So you can see kind of the, the timeline as set forth here. Uh, one topic we heard hey, Jack, Can I ask a question? Yes, remember Somewhere along listen. the way, and I don't know, this might be Apple Card's upset in, in terms of Let's say the legislature passes a half cent transit or transportation sales tax. Question is, how will that affect what our solicitation, solicitation looks like? If there's a major influx of dollars. So I don't know where you would factor this in in the schedule if we have to almost do Apple Card upset because of a tremendous amount of new money. Sure. Good, good question, Amy. I don't know if you want to. It, was that it, was that money being directed? This that was money being directed in part to the tab. Some of that money or no? That was just transit yeah. money. Yeah. Half cent sales. That's, a, that's an open question. Yeah, that's what I thought. What's going to happen? I, I think that's under debate of where the transit tra transit uh, sales tax where it ends up. up. Yeah. Some have said it might go to the Met Council, but I don't know. That's why it would be nice to have Judd here. <laughs> Where's Judd? Yeah. So, well, so <laughs> He's well, at the Capitol, probably. Yeah, Char we've got Charles. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioner. Yeah, I think it is a good question. Uh, the governor proposed a one eighth cent sales tax that would be used for transit purposes. Uh, there has been some feedback that others are interested in higher rates or other structures or other, other things like that. And, they will be continuing to watch for specific proposals, especially at ones that might get into uh, opportunities like what you're describing. But uh, so far, we haven't really had something concrete to react to. Yeah, um, Member Barber. Chair. Thank you. Um, and I just add to that that the whatever funds from um, hopefully we get funding for transit um, uh, right now because we are still in a structural deficit into the future for our operations, just for our bus operations. And so a lot of these, um, uh, the uh, proposals that are going through the legislature are really to help fill that gap so we have a reliable funding source into the future. Because right now, um, but for the COVID stimulus money, we would be in a structural deficit situation now because we get funded with one-time cycles instead of ongoing. All right, so we'll, we'll drive on with our current plan until something else changes, <laughs> and we'll turn yes. back to you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, another comment we received that last month at the tab was, how does the existing regional association tie back to the long-range plan, the TPP, Transportation Policy Plan? Uh, so this is a chart that we do have in the application. It's also shown um, in the TPP that connects um, the prioritizing criteria in the solicitation, shown in dark blue, um, to both the Thrive Outcomes and, in this case, the 2040 uh, TPP. So uh, some of that work has been done, and our goal really for the next, for 2026, is to more closely link um, all this together. Okay, now uh, we've got a series of different topics that we wanted to bring forth and get some direction. Again, uh, Chair Thompson's uh, leading the meeting tomorrow with our Funding and Programming Committee. Uh, we've got the same slide deck for them, so we did want to get some direction on on uh, where to head on a few of these items. So uh, first and foremost, uh, criteria and measure weighting. We heard both in the surveys and then at TAB uh, over the last few months that both emissions and safety were kind of key topic areas that people wanted to see more points given to in the application. Um, on the emissions front, maybe we'll just tackle that first. Um, we're in the midst of a, a study, a greenhouse gas study, where we'll come up with measures to better use in the solicitation. So we're probably a little ways out on that. Um, we're looking at the 2026 cycle, but safety is where I think we can make an impact th uh, this 2024 cycle, and, and we've brought this to our technical committees, 
And uh, the idea that staff has put on the table was to add an additional 100 points in many of the categories. Um, that would be all the roadway categories minus bridges, uh, which doesn't have safety currently, uh, the bicycle pedestrian categories, and then we also heard attack uh, to put those in the two transit uh, categories, that would be transit expansion and modernization. Uh, that would be a little different twist. We don't have a safety measure there, but it is covered under the multimodal connection, so it wouldn't be uh, passenger safety um, on the LRT or, uh, or security. It would be more um, safety in the terms of uh, sidewalks and trail connections to those bus stops or transit stations. Um, and that and increasing the safety of, of people walking and biking uh, to get onto transit. So that's on the transit side, be a little, little bit different being the multimodal, but uh, for roadways and bike pad, there are specific safety measures and criterion that we do have. Um, so again, we thought uh, that adding 100 points, so we'd have some categories that are, are 1,200, some categories are 1,100, but uh, again, this is really a one-time change before we dig into the details. And as, as opposed to, uh, you know, we could spend uh, several months trying to figure out where to take the points from. I think Chair Thompson talked about that a little bit. Uh, so we thought the easiest way would just be add 100 points. Uh, that would value safety uh, more than it is currently and um, kind of respond to some of the needs we've heard both from the surveys and from TAB. So any, any questions there or direction from the group? Yeah, I'm going to just start with Member Geisler, who's the points guy. Uh, <laughs> he is. Uh, <laughs> I was going to call him even if you didn't raise your hand. Go ahead, and then I've got... Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, yeah, from from the points perspective, you know, I think it's clear that adding more points just dilutes the points everywhere else. So it de-emphasizes every other category, um, and and that that is the easy way to, to do it. Um, you could also just take away the same amount of percentage points from every other category and have the same result, and everything's still eleven hundred points. Um, Personally, I'm not a huge fan of just tacking on more points because it kind of obfuscates what we're doing in that we're de-emphasizing everything and bringing safety up in a way because it, mm -hmm. it, it's still getting the same points, but it means less <laughs> for all of those other categories. I think it'd be, it's clearer to say we're taking you from 70, or 100 points down to 90 points and those went to safety. I think that sends a clearer message. Um, in concept, though, the idea of shifting points to safety, I 100% agree with, and I think you know we're doing it. So if we do it this way just for this cycle, because we know we're doing a full rebuild on the next cycle, I understand that that's path of least resistance. I can get that. But I think we need to really clearly message that this dilutes the impact of every other category, including risk, including role in the system, including usage, everything gets diluted. Um, so that, that's just my only point on, on what this effectively does for the scores. Thank you. Um, before I turn to Member Gattel, I just want to clarify on your slide, you've got one, two, and three. Uh, are those like this option one, option two, option three? Because the points don't add up. Uh, one has 50 points, and then the number two is 50 plus 50. So I'm just, what are you trying to say there is sure. what I'm asking. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's a good, good point of clarification. So uh, 50 points, uh, the first number, it's not separate options. These are how it would be, how it would be impacted on specific application categories okay. um, because the measures are slightly different. So the first one is 50 points. That's in traffic management technologies, more of the signal timing. And so we specifically say this is where the points would go. Um, number two is 50 points. These are the roadway categories. Half, half for the normal crash reduction, half for pedestrian safety. So we split the 100 points there. Okay. And then uh, number three is the 50 points is for the bicycle pedestrian categories. So how you would split up those points in the specific measures. And then the missing one is the transit, uh, which I talked about would be number four, which we'll add for next time would be in the multimodal categories. And Elaine can add on there too. Go ahead, Elaine. And I, I think where the confusion is, I think like for number one, where it says 50 points each, so it would be 50 points crash reduction, 50 mm -hmm. points safety issues. Got it. Okay. That makes more sense. That's 100. 100 yeah, total that's where it's, 100. Because 100. number two, you split them up and said 50-50, where one and three, you did not. You just put the word each. And it didn't clarify mm -hmm. which. Thank you for that. Good clarification. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks. Uh, Member Gattel. 
Thank you, um, Chair. I appreciate that. Um, I just want to say that I agree with Member Geisler about diluting points. So when we go rebuild, I don't want to see more points. I want to see this incorporated in as well. And I'm sure there will be a lot of us around the table to have that discussion when we look at rebuilding that. Uh, you know, at Hennepin County, we support the emphasis on safety. We're all looking at zero safety issues around us. We've had high numbers of... Uh, critical accidents and fatalities and so we all want to look at that I think and I'm I'm very supportive of this also I'm supportive on waiting on this emissions measures until we have some clarity and we have some real directions from the from the study I think that's a, a good idea because we we bat we've been baffled by where to put all this anyway and I think we'll have a better idea and a conclusion we'll have directions from both the federal and the state thank you uh, member Lewis Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, echo the comments um, regarding consistency and dilution of the scoring. Um, it feels like the emphasis on safety seems to be fairly universal. That there's support for it, but it seems to come at the expense of the trade-offs that we might have to make. And it worries me a bit from a consistency perspective in terms of when the next thing comes up, are we going to add points in future scenarios, whether it's emissions or capacity or transit or whatever it is, I was just asked the question of how we um, square this from a, a consistency and precedent standpoint. And then maybe a question on the emissions front is, if we have to wait that long, what is the answer that we're silent in terms of addressing emissions between now and then, or we're just saying we believe it is better to wait? Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members. So a couple, a couple questions there. So on, on emissions, um, that study is is already started. So Tony Fisher from our staff from our staff is leading that uh, multimodal greenhouse gas study, and um, we'll be digging into those results as it pertains to the 2026 cycle and the TPP um, this year. And I think we I think we have a presentation to tab in the next two months here on that. So it's it's coming uh, it's coming, and uh, just have to do the technical work to get there. And your the other question was on the dilution and how we kind of square this for the next cycle, right? Yeah, more so from a precedent standpoint, yeah. meaning if there are future things that we receive feedback on that it's an imperative, would this set our stance to say our default approach is to just add points versus reality points? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair Member. So good good question. Uh, back uh, 10 years ago when we did this big reevaluation, we started with 1,000 points in each of the categories. And then we added cost effectiveness for 100 points. So that's how we got to 1,100 points. And now essentially we're adding another 100 to get, get more safety points. But I think once uh, this summer we start the reevaluation, we will essentially start from, from ground up. And uh, so it wouldn't be a, an additive process onto this. We'd, we're going to take a look at all the scores and maybe it'll look completely different. It might be out of, um, you know, not going to predict, but it could, could be very different. We're going to start from the ground up, I guess, is the, the main point. Thank you. Um, I've got Member Dugan next. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will pass. Uh, uh, Elaine read my mind on that question. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Elaine. All right. Uh, Member Jepson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I agree with um, Member Geisler and Gattel regarding the dilution of just adding 100 points to the total. I think it's an easy, simple solution, mm -hmm. and I don't think this work is either easy or simple. Um, in addition, I would challenge the group to add even more weight to the safety category because, you know, many of us were sitting here last year trying to get to zero deaths, and those numbers just keep climbing and climbing and climbing. And until this group does some serious work in the safety of our residents, that number is going to continue to climb. And I don't think that is easy or simple either. Uh, so I don't know what that means for adding points, changing points, um, but we are in this privileged position uh, to do some serious work for the safety of our residents and our citizens, and I think it starts right now. Thank you. Uh, Member Hollingshead. Did, no? Okay. <laughs> All right. But Maybe it was Martinson. Sorry. Okay. So, so this is a question that uh, sort of crosses mm -hmm. between the safety and the emissions question um, because I don't see, well, while I see there's the greenhouse gas study, I have, this is a question that I will ask because I'm ignorant of what is and is not included in the greenhouse gases. So it's not clear to me whether, well, sorry, let me preface why I'm asking my question. 
So from a public health standpoint, I consider particulate matter 10 and 2.5 to be issues of safety in the transportation systems that we are exposed to on a daily basis, particularly those of us that live in the core cities. And so, so what I don't know is if the greenhouse gas study is including any focus on PM 2.5 and or PM 10 in addition to, because those are not necessarily greenhouse gas issues, but they are definitely emissions and they are definitely safety issues. So does the study include those? And if not, then we need to be taking that up separately, I think. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, the study does focus on greenhouse gas emissions, but usually it is a, a simple equation to get to those other criteria pollutants. Um, currently in the solicitation, we do measure PM 2.5, NOx, and carbon monoxide. Those are the, those are the CMAC uh, criteria pollutants that we're asked to, to measure for that money that comes through the region. And so um, we can get back to you on the specifics, but in most cases it is an equation. Once you have one, you can get the others uh, because they're derived from a, from a certain place. But uh, we can get back to you. And like I said, we do have a presentation coming in the next two months um, specific to that study. All right, um, Member Anderson. Uh, I agree with, with uh, many of the comments. However, I, I guess I want to caution us not to overcomplicate uh, wh where we don't have to. This is a, a measure to get us through for a temporary time. Uh, the emphasis on safety seems to strike a chord with everyone, as it should. Uh, I, and I would caution us not to drag ourselves into a discussion about every other category just based on this. As time goes on, we have certainly um, emphasized different criteria as being more important due to the times that we're in. So. Going forward, you know, I think it's a good time to look at those things, but let's just get this through right now and, and, and rebuild as time goes on here. Thank you. Member Gattel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. Um, I want to follow up on a comment made by uh, Member Jepson, you know, about getting serious about some of the safety issues that we're going. One of the things that's happening is we were talking, and this has already been mentioned, about EV vehicles, and they're coming into vogue now. They're heavier than other vehicles. Mm -hmm. The crash impact is very different. What I have found out in some of the review and asking my staff to dig a little further is that the University of Minnesota and MnDOT are participating in some study and getting crash criteria from other parts of the world where they have EVs and what that looks like. We probably need to have that data. We probably need to be thinking about that as we move forward into the safety area. If we want to get serious about this, then we have to know the impact of what's going to happen on our roads with that type of a vehicle coming into vogue. So it'd be nice to see that on one of our informations. Well, we'll add that to the list. Uh, Member Karwaski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Steve, I have two points, and maybe you could comment on them, and maybe I'm missing something, too. One, um, we haven't made progress on safety. So when these points, whether they're, however you formulate the points, how can we, uh, you know, what would be the criteria where it really results in, it results in positive progress? I'll be curious to see something on that. That. And then my second point is, it would seem to me that the safety points, uh, most people are killed on roads. So are the points, uh, are, are more the points available to be scored on safety elements of roads? Or am I missing something where you could say, well, we're going to skip that lane and add a bike trail, and then obviously less people on that road, you know, they replace them with bikers, that's safer. That, I'm saying that, that's to me is not the solution. I'm all for bike trails where appropriate, so. Uh. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So there, um, that first page of attachment one, you know, the third row, maybe I'll just go into it here quick. You can. If you, if you track uh, safety, that third, third row across, you can see how many points. It is across the categories. So the first few are the roadway categories. You know, ranges from 14 to 30 percent. Um, bike ped, 23 to 27 percent, and then uh, again, transits in the multimodal facilities. So that's currently 9 percent, but would be in increased. Uh, so it does it does vary a little bit. Uh, you know, when you do add points anywhere, then 
the applicants respond by, you know, they think about projects that they want to submit because they want money to <laughs> deliver projects. So, you know, the applicants will respond accordingly depending on the system that collectively TAB um, puts together. And so that's where you get more safety projects and more projects elements within projects that um, are geared towards safety by, by you know, putting more points there. We did do, you know, and Lane, maybe you can jump into, we did do an uh, internal analysis on, uh, Bethany did, and maybe we can look at, because I'm hearing a couple things here and not diluting the points, um, and maybe it's, you know, maybe it's simpler to do it this way, but we don't want to dilute the points. We've done a little bit of internal analysis on kind of what the difference would be looking back at the last cycle, and that's maybe some of the data you need here to say, does, is it worth our time to dig into this, or should we just kind of on the top put another 100 or 200 or whatever number of points on it? Um, so Elaine, now you may be closer to that than I am, but I remember Bethany did started that work and, and yeah, she did a quick look of adding points where we thought they would have been added yep. in by prorating the points, not just because not everybody would have got 100 points extra. It would have been if they got 50 percent of the points, they mm -hmm. got 50 percent of the hundred that was added, and it changed a few of the projects that would have been funded, or maybe they've changed the ranking. Mm -hmm. But depending on where they were of not being funded, how far they were down, whether it would have adjusted it, and maybe 100 points may not have been enough to make much of a difference. Um, again, last round we had a lot more money too, so whether that would have changed going forward to the next one, so maybe making an impact might need more than 100 points. Member Geisler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I wanna be clear about what the dilution piece is, is when it's uniform across the board, in some areas, we have some points where there are 50 or 40 points. Those measures almost become immaterial and shouldn't be scored. And so that's where I think reallocating is the more appropriate way to do this. I also, when I look at spot mobility as a great example, 30% of the points in spot mobility are already allocated to safety. And in the, in the, new, the new proposed version, it would go up to 36%. And so my, my question is, how far do we go? And I'm not saying that safety isn't important, but at, at some point we do have to score these other attributes of projects. <clears throat> and so I, I would like us to come up with a sense of, as a percentage, forget all the points, the numbers part of it, what is the target number for safety? Is it 20%, 20 25%, 25, 30? Where, where do we want to go with that? And then come back to the, the actual numbers. Because when I look at, for instance, strategic capacity, 40 points go to infrastructure age, but most of the time we're talking about redoing things because they're old or they're too small. Um, that's a part of it, but then when we, all the rest of the points are spread across role in the system, usage, equity, but then other, other categories are very lumpy where their highest scoring point piece is. So I don't know that the same answer is true for, and I'm just using roads because that's where most of this is, the same answer for traffic management spot and strategic capacity is just take everything out of everywhere. So I get that it, it is a messier conversation to get into it, but that's what we're here for is to decide what to de-emphasize and what to emphasize and provide you that insight for the trade-off. So I, I, um, I understand that it's the simplest way to do it, but when we, when we look at where we're going in the future, when we look at we're not gonna do something on emissions for this for good reason, should we reduce the points in congestion and air quality by de facto by diluting them? Probably not. Maybe we should preserve those points if we wanna keep it to Member Martin's point, at least a focus on what we already have. And should we de-emphasize other aspects of the solicitation, which is where, again, we come back to reallocating points. Um, so that's, what, when we talk about diluting, we don't wanna have measures become immaterial, that they're not worth even doing any effort on. We also, I don't think we need the same answer in every single category of what to, what to dilute or what to take out. So I just round that conversation out. Thank you, yeah, I'm Michael. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Member Geisler. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the questions we are wrestling with at the technical level is, is it, is it in our purview to take away from, is it multimodal facilities, infrastructure age, equity and housing, put that towards safety. And hearing from staff, we're kind of on a tight timeline, so we don't have time to do the full revamp like we'd like to do for 2026. Um, so I think it was Member Anderson or somebody mentioned, this is kind of the stopgap where 
hey, we heard that tab, safety is a priority, that filtered to us. This is something we can do as an interim measure. It may or may not be effective, but it's a gesture. But I do think we need to dive a lot deeper if we're gonna make structural changes to outcomes. And that's where my understanding is we only have one funding and programming meeting to make all this happen. You know, we don't have time for breakouts and all <coughs> that. Um, but, and that's exactly, it's great to hear the discussion and the comment today and something that I can bring forward to our members. Uh, Member Jepson. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so <laughs> to Member Ulrich's point earlier and then to Member Anderson's point earlier, uh, not to upset the apple cart here, but if we are on a time crunch, this, we could be going back and forth and nitpicking mm -hmm. and stuff. And if we're going to revamp the whole thing anyway, I don't want this to be a symbol symbolic gesture of a huge magnitude of millions and millions of dollars. So, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars. So to the point of streamlining this, in order to give us the three, two and a half years to really figure this out, what if we just take the pot of money, trust the counties that we know what safety projects we have, what transit projects we have, what bike ped projects we have, give us the funds, we'll disperse that to our communities where we know need the greatest impact. And so that would be a pretty simple thing to do right now, get it done, and then spend the quality time in figuring out how this is going to work in the future. Nice. Thank you, Member Jepson. Uh, Member Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think what's really challenging to understand sort of the impact of this shift of 100 points is that and again, I actually don't know. Is this the the numbers for after this proposed change, or this is before because it's, it's eleven hundred yeah. for all these? Yeah. You know, it, it's hard to tell what the before and after impact is. And this actually goes to a member Jepson's comment here about is this making an impact for this solicitation? Because you could see that this may be you know just a, a couple percentage difference. You know, and would this actually change which projects got funded, or does it just look good that we shifted to you know safety for a, a higher emphasis? So I, I, I don't know if we have time to do that, you know, certainly don't today for the time, but, you know, I'd love to see sort of the current versus proposed to see the actual shifts for these different categories, because it's just, it's really dense and it's hard to understand how big a difference 100 points even would make at this point. Go ahead, Michael. Madam Chair, and, and I think staff looked into this a little bit. I think there's going to have to be some major changes, not just the 100 points, if we really want to elevate projects in certain modal categories elevate that as the safest project higher. So um, I don't know the answer, but I think this is a good discussion and I'll be sure to share this information with our members. Yeah, um, Member Jenkins. Cool, okay, already. <laughs> so this is my question as a new member. One of the, the impacts of adding the 100 points is we also changed the total points in some categories and not others. I agree, long term, you know, this needs to be completely reworked. But for the 2024 solicitations, are we having an impact on those categories that don't get bumped up by having some categories with more points? To the very first comment in this whole discussion, to Member Geisler's comment, I mean, as a matter of math, couldn't we just go in and say, okay, 1,200, you know, break it down by percentages and keep everything at 1,100, but just change the percentage according to your end result of adding 100 points. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just instead of breaking it down to 1,200 points, at 1,100 points, it's 34% instead of 36 or whatever it is. Because I'm not sure what the impact is of changing each of the category total points as well. Yeah, maybe I could, Madam Chair, jump in and defer to staff. But my understanding is as long as you have like, the, let's say the midpoint scenario you go with, I mean, you're still going to have pedestrian projects funded um, at the same level, but the road, let's say if you only added safety to roads, I think it would just elevate the safest road projects a little higher within that category. Um, so I, I, I don't know that it would take away from pedestrian and put it into roads. Let's say if you had 1,200 points in roads and only 1,100 in pedestrian. Um, but I can defer to staff. Yep. 
Yeah. yeah, if you, you you know if you go back 15 years, we had categories that had different differing point values, and you're compared against projects within your application category, so it doesn't matter. The, the only ones that would not be affected by um, would be TDM and bridges would be the only two that would be would stay at 1100. Um, okay, points. so for educational purposes, for me, there are not any projects that fit multiple categories. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. We ask uh, applicants to submit in one, one category that best fits the project type. Yeah, and we, you know, we could, uh, if you wanted to keep it at 1,100, we could go back and kind of do the math proportionally to, and look at it that way. It, it uh, makes sense in concept to me, at least. It's in practice tough. It's, it makes, it's a mess to do and, um, with our systems, and that's maybe not an, it's not your problem, it's our problem as staff, but it does make, it is, it is much trickier to do it that way, but we, you know, we could do some data analysis to see if, see if does that make a difference or not? Um, but, but I'm hearing that we're not quite there on this, that we need to, we need more information for TAB, maybe some other options on how to do this, and we're just, and t we'll start tomorrow. <laughs> Michael, with Michael and friends. Yeah. Any, any other comments? I, I would agree that we're not quite there. Yeah. Uh, it feels overall like we need a little more information. I mean, mm -hmm. you gave us one option, and then it was like yes or no, and I think <laughs> the answer is like give us another option. It uh, doesn't mean this is off the table, but give us another option. Uh, yeah, Member Barber. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, also, I think when we look at, make sure you are looking at pedestrian and bike as well, because um, Honestly, if you look at some of the data, um, I, I just pulled up our pedestrian report. It said even though Whatcom represents 6% of trips in the Seven County Metro, they account for 34% of the traffic fatalities. That's right. And I think that got worse over the last few years, especially with a lot of people over the COVID pandemic um, switching over to bike usage. Um, we're seeing a lot of those trends. So we want to make sure that we're looking at the safety from that perspective as well. Yeah. Thank you, Member Barber. Uh, go ahead. I just want to ask for clarification for direction to staff what you want them to look at. So if it's adding more points than the 100, is it pr the prorating down? I think both, we want or? a couple other scenarios okay. to react to with a little more data points of what else could we do to make this more less diluted. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Should we move on, Madam we Chair? Should, yes. Okay. Let's so move that'll, on. Uh, so we're that'll be talk some about driver shortage. <laughs> Yep, right. right, in a second here. So okay. a few of the other um, maybe topics uh, before we get to, to Metro Transit here um, that we wanted to bring back to this group. One is on agency priorities. We heard that from a few TAB members, kind of this push and pull of regional priorities versus maybe local priorities when you submit more than one application. Um, from the technical uh, committees, <clears throat> we're hearing that's something that we should think about more in the 2026 cycle. Um, there's people kind of on both both sides of that uh, debate and, and uh, thinking that that's something that we need to have a work group on and, and think, of, think about more for 2026. Yeah. I'll just kind of quickly run through these, maybe, unless there's yeah, a comment. Yeah. A comment a comment. Thank you. I'll be very fast. You know, county staff um, isn't supporting applicants, you know, who have identified priority projects because we're really – we're really unsure how this information benefits a data-driven process here. So, you know, sometimes that may really hinder us from getting anything through. So I just, I don't know that we want to put a priority project, especially when we're putting a lot of them in different categories and doing them. So I don't know that I'm ready to do that. So I would appreciate a study work group on something like this. Do you want to respond to that? Otherwise, Member Geisler has a comment as well. Uh, I, I was just going to say, uh, I think we can capture agency priorities by where they invest their time and energy and money to score points, especially mm -hmm. in things like housing and equity, where their engagement with the public and what their outreach and all those help them get more points and get bonus points. And there are ways for agencies to emphasize by scoring better, by engaging in more of some of those discretionary categories. Um, but might be a better idea to look at, are there other discretionary places for the, the next big revamp where they can choose to invest more resources and therefore score more and hopefully bubble up the list. Yeah, and uh, Member Barber. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to channel my Carver County um, uh, people because they're not here today. And I think this comes out of the example last time where, the, as we said, things can, they can apply in different categories. And one project did better than another. They put the same effort into both and, and passion behind it. 
but it became clear towards the end that they had a, a preference of really what they wanted. So I think it would help uh, us to know if there are local priorities. Um, I don't know if it's just a survey of, of applicants or something like that, that, you know, like if it comes down to where we're deciding about something in a, in a, in a tie situation, I know that's one of our topics we're going, it would be good to know that information. Uh, this would be the priority for that particular entity. It seems to me uh, to that point that it wouldn't be unlike as we local government submit bonding priorities to the legislature, we rate them in order, whether it meets criteria or gets funded, but we rate them in order of our own requests. So that might be the way to do that. Uh, yeah, Member Ulrich. It is a little uh, confusing here because, you know, a jurisdiction like Carver, I think last time had like 14 applications, got a bunch of them funded, but probably not their main priority or their number one priority. And so that's a problem. But then in some other solicitations, Scott County has taken a little criticism because we may be submitted just one or two because that was our priority. And it's almost like we were accused of gaming the system saying, well, you know you're going to get some money and just submitting one, it's almost like pointing your finger and saying, fund that one. I mean, so it is a, it's a difficult equation, I think. And Madam Chair, we're... If I can just interject yeah. quick. And it, it may not have scored that well. I mean, you may have a priority, but it scored really low. So are you going to give them that project and put it above all these others that scored well? So we all submit into different categories, right? So I'm not so sure we it's data-driven. It's not. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thanks for your comment. You know, this is one issue we'll get into in the reevaluation because we're going to do a peer study of 10 to 15 other MPOs. And... You, you can't quite do what uh, Commissioner Jepson said about give it out to the counties. It'd be easier for from all of us, Come but <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, you do have to have a competitive <laughs> process, but there are hybrid models out there where you do kind of a mix of kind of regional things and then have some money go out and it's kind of decided at kind of smaller units of smaller geographies, I'll say. And so we'll be looking at some of those different models and you can say, I like it, or I don't like it, um, or I like what we're doing. But that'll be, uh, we'll have time to kind of get into that uh, this summer and into the fall. Yeah, Elaine. I do, I do want to address the, the fact about dividing the money out. Federally, mm -hmm. we are not able to do that. We have to do a solicitation. Yeah, Chicago tried that, and the federal government said, no, I can't do that. <laughs> well, we don't want to be Chicago, yeah. so no, that's <laughs> uniform. All right, thanks. Continue. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, another issue that came up. You know, in this committee, especially in the November, uh, last November's TAB meeting where we had a tide score in multi-use trails, and it seems to happen every, every cycle. We've got out of 11 or 1,200 points, we get a tide score. Um, we're suggesting here at the staff recommendation and conferred with uh, te the technical folks as well that if we do have a tie next time, you can consider other things such as geographic balance or a high safety score or other, um, other kind of policy angles that you want to take. Um, um, in breaking a tide score. So that's from, so I guess that would be our recommendation is that we shouldn't be held to kind of keep both projects or not do both projects, that their tab should have some discretion to say we want to do one of the two projects for this reason. Yeah, Member Gattel. And I just want to say that, you know, in general, we, we have, and, and I've sat mm -hmm. on here for a while, as some of my other colleagues around the table here, and I think we do a pretty good job of ferreting that out ourselves, among ourselves here, about what we want to do and priorities. And there's been times when, as county, I have given up a project so that somebody else's project got funded or because it was better for the greater good. And I'm happy, you know, happy to do that you know, in the future, but I think it's really good. This body does very well working together in a in a consensus type of a matter to try to make everybody um, feel like they got a piece of the pie. Member Martinson. So I, I appreciate the, uh, the idea of having some additional criteria beyond the scoring that can be applied in breaking a tie. Mm -hmm. I just want to ensure that those criteria are clear in advance, mm -hmm. that we know what they are, and that everybody sort of follows them to maintain the integrity of the process. Because part of what happened back in November was that when the tie came up and the discussion came up about it, there was some, um, I'll call it gaming that I think was going on. And I would like to avoid that for the integrity of the process. Thank you, Member Martinson. Member Geisler. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, you know, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, staff's pointing out that the, the scores aren't precise enough, so there isn't enough fidelity. We could double the points that are there to give you more fidelity. You could add a decimal point and you get more fidelity too. Mm -hmm. it, without changing any of the weighting or any of the focusing, you just double all the point scores and you get a little bit more differentiation. 
Um, that's the way to do it. It's also worth pointing out that these ties only matter when they're on the funding cusp. You, we had ties that are all above the line. We don't even pay attention to those. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it is truly tied scores that are above and below the line is the problem here. So it's, it, 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 we still keep having them, <laughs> but they, they're pretty, they're, you know, and, and maybe that's something that staff needs to think about when they're presenting the funding mm -hmm. things, especially since we're setting ranges and there are availabilities to move up and down. Some of the projects have gotten pretty large, which makes big shifts happen when you add two versus one. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think this does come down ultimately to a scoring fidelity question of if you truly have a tie, Maybe they both need to be rescored and make sure that is that 35 points or 36 points? You know, which for each little thing, make sure that those scorers are confident in what they're doing because you might not have any then. Yeah, so there might be a score, uh, Madam Chair, there might be a kind of a scoring. Uh, the scoring committees maybe could look into this a little bit before they release the draft scores. It's Okay, here's the scoring list. Um, do we need to break some of these ties before the scores are released for whatever reason? Yeah, that's one way to do it. Yeah, go ahead, Elaine. Part of the issue is when the scoring committees score, they score their measures, and one might get 20 and one and 30, and then it gets reversed on another me measure. And then when it gets totaled, they're both 50. And so that's where you come up with the tie. And then after the scores are done, to get the totals, and then we do a calculation on the cost effectiveness, and sometimes that creates the tie. So it's a mm -hmm. Got it. multiple, multiple calculations being done. Member Jenkins and then all right. So perfect feed into my question, and that is, and, and this can be dangerous and would require some really good messaging, but do you also put a priority on those scoring categories? These two projects tied, but this one did better on one category than the other one, and therefore that one breaks the tie. Yeah, go ahead. That's one, yep. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Yeah, that's, that's uh, another potential solution is just, you know, maybe it's safety. That's one right. with the highest safety score breaks the tie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. On uh, Thank you. Yeah, scoring ahead, differentiation, I just want to point out the, one of the big problems we had in the last solicitation was the unique project category. Those are scare, scored on one through five. So you can imagine how little ability to show differentiation with five total points to be divided. That's got to be changed. Yes. Okay. Good, good feedback. Thank you. Member Dugan. Yeah. Thank you. If I may follow up on, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I may follow up on Commissioner Gattel's comment um, regarding, you know, the trading projects or whatever. In the, except for the last regional solicitation and Mr. Jenkins' question, uh, the previous ones, I think I've been on four, four or five, uh, there was this time when we came to the end and it wasn't just trading, it was those qualitative decisions that were made on funding. And that's whether it be a tie or geographic balance or something for Scott or Carver or, or perhaps a, you know, a, a, not a more suburban community. And uh, I did also want to follow up with uh, Ms. Gattel. Uh, uh, I just was looking it up. That, uh, <clears throat> pickup trucks, electric pickup trucks are about two to 3,000 pounds more than a gasoline. And the uh, battery pack for the G GFC Hummer is, weighs more than the, the Honda Civic. Oh. 2,900 20, 20, pounds. I know. So. Wow. Yeah. And, right. and, and there was just also a study from the UK that um, the tire wear and tire emissions is quite significantly increased okay. because of the weight. Surprised. This is why we need transit. Right. Back yeah. to you, Michael. This one. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> okay, I think we got some feedback on this one. I want to make sure we get through this here today. Uh, this one might generate some discussion. This was uh, the bus rapid transit BRT limit, and people that were on the committee, I guess, two cycles ago, we had a policy work group that work, work through this and other issues. And the text as shown in the application um, says that you're gonna fund at least uh, one project in, in a new market area. And then the combined total for both the ABRT, again, was 25 million per cycle, plus the competitive categories <laughs> would be up to 32 million. So, uh, you know, we thought through that pretty pretty well, and then we jumped from 200 million to 350 million dollars last cycle. So we had this big influx of money, 
And so this rule with kind of a fixed dollar amount didn't work quite as well last, last time where we ended up funding you know, 18 out of the 20 transit projects that were submitted. Uh, so you know, based on the spirit of that initial discussion, uh, what the staff recommendation here is, is uh, to require at least two projects uh, directly, not directly tied to BRT projects to be funded. So again, when we did the math back two cycles ago, um, and you add all the stuff up, but there was $15 million left for non-BRT projects. So those are the local service expansion projects um, on our system that we wanted to kind of carve out a, a place for. So those projects still had a chance to get the funding. Um, so this is kind of in that spirit of that rule that we would fund at least two projects that aren't BRT. Um, and that would get rid of some of the maybe specific point or dollar values that are shown in the current application. And there's, you know, there's a couple ways to do it by percentage or project types, but we thought because it used to be 15 million, um, which is essentially two projects and maybe just a little bit more than that, um, that's why we tied it back to projects and said maybe the rule should be about projects versus um, the other way around with the $32 million max. So, uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back to you, and if people have other questions, we can go through that too. Uh, Member Holberg. So this... Um there's been varying degrees of support for the BRT funding at the state level. And before we set this one, I think it would make a lot of sense to look at what's already in the pipeline that's been set aside. I think we're up to the G line now. Um, and what the state money and show us, I mean, the Met Council can only do so many lines a year, implement, start out. So I'd like to see the funding streams and the progression of the different lines <coughs> and whether we actually need to stay at this funding level in order to accomplish. I mean, the current bonding bill had like 75 million mm -hmm. for our chair of BRT. And so absent kind of the big picture on this, I don't know if these are the right numbers. Thank you, did you wanna to respond? To Wait. Um, I'll, I'll maybe wait until Adam, uh, maybe it. in the next presentation, Adam uh, here can well, take up that question. And then it's question. Just kind of to this point, I mean, our, you're asking for us to finalize this in May, five or six days before the legislative session is over. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any opportunity to move mm -hmm. tab to the following Wednesday so we would actually know what was funded and what wasn't before we finalize this stuff, it just, you know, I mean, I know it's going out for public comments and it could change again in the fall, but in my mind, it's nice to have as close to what you think you want before you send it out for public comments. Uh, Cole, if I can just respond, um, I'm Cole Henniker, Met Council staff. Um, I think, <coughs> What, what we're trying to accomplish with this rule is actually giving us more of that flexibility. So having the number set in there right now, you know, locks us in. And this would just say, you know, BRT, we're, we're, we don't want to overinvest in BRT. We want to give flexibility to other projects. We can change this to three. We could change this to four. But to ensure that other projects are going to get funded, not just BRT, I think is the intent of this rule. And so I think if we can structure it where we don't have to react to what the state funds I um, mean, we're, we're more just saying no matter what we do in the solicitation, we're going to guarantee at least a certain number of non-BRT projects are funded. Then that gives us that flexibility to react to the state. Uh, right, but my point is the dollar amount. You might not need $25 million for BRT when this, when all is said and done. Yeah, and I, I think our proposal here takes the dollar amount out of the rules and says let's just focus on the number of non-BRT projects we want to fund. Does that make sense? Yeah, but you say the combined maximum would be 32 million. That's my point. Maybe it's 25 million combined. Maybe it's 40 million. I don't know. But until we have a chance to look at the timing and the implementation and how it all lays out given state funding and what we've already put in the pipeline in the last three solicitations, I don't know what that number should be. We should take it off autopilot, I guess is what I'm saying, that there should be some analysis of the funding stream. 
Um, yep, we got uh, Gattel, Ben Geisler, Martinson, and Anderson. So, so following up on that, okay. yes, we don't know what's coming down from the legislature and what we really need here. And after county's been having conversations with Met Council and others, it doesn't appear as if there's, um, you know, great support to increase that amount past 32, at least not at this time, but we don't have the Met, we don't have stuff from the state. So I, I wonder where that's at as well. So I have that same um, thought about that. Um, one of the other things I just want to make this as a mantra I've spoke to before is that um, we support the need for Met Transit to fully scope ABRT projects to include all accessibility um, scope in the project for all safety program, um, improvements that are needed throughout the entire corridor, not just at the four plexus. So that's a really, that's a really big thing for county and for cities so that they're not so highly impacted. Senator Geisler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm gonna put on the way back hat here and talk about why when we created this rule, what we talked about in that policy committee, because I was there, um, the 32 number came from 25 million to ABRT 7 million transit expansion was the cap. So we said no more than a BRT money and one more BRT project. That was the essence of this rule was to not make sure, it, not, not about one or two projects that weren't BRT. It was about saying <coughs> a BRT plus one extra fully funded BRT project and then the rest goes to everywhere else in the system. That was what we talked about in that session. And so I, I agree with, with I sort of agree and disagree with staff's interpretation of that of the intent here. The intent was to make sure that we don't overspend in BRT and let money go to other transit expansion opportunities. So I would I, I would actually see this as say no more than two or three BRT projects get funded and everything else goes. I, I would flip the conversation here. Um, that, that was, that was what the intent was. That's why the 32 number came out though. It's 25 plus seven. That's the maximums for those categories. So that's, it's not a fully out of thin air. Um, if it was a percentage of the funding modes, that'd be fine too. I, again, we, we talked about some tactical problems on that, but that, that was the genesis of the 32 number. So I just want to clarify because you brought up a question and Cole mentioned this actually what you're suggesting removes the 32 and just puts a number of projects, right? Is that what you were saying? That's what the current proposal is. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, I think that we're, we're trying to accomplish the same thing in yeah. either direction we go. If the maximum number amount is preferred, <laughs> then we just need to pick a number that work, makes sense because the current number is 32 based on the old amount of funding prior to the IIJ bill. Mm -hmm. which we've just, we've added 50, well, about 25% more dollars. So yeah. we just feel like that number should be revisited and that direction actually came from TAB during the last project selection process. So my question actually just blends Geisler's and Holberg's together is that if we don't know what exactly that pot of money is, I think it removing the dollar amount and getting to a number of projects because inflation, cost, overages, all that stuff. We don't actually know how much money we're talking about. And we might say 32, but that might only get us, you know, half as many projects as we're guessing. And so I think there's a place there. So um, thanks. And if I could just follow that piece up, you know, I, I the 32 was just meant to be yeah. one plus one. Yeah. So it could have been one plus one at the time. Yeah. And, and that would have been fine. Because we, at the time, every transit expansion project was $7 million was what it was asking for. Everybody always went for the max. So... That's where it came from. But what, what I worry about how this is structured, though, of at least two project, projects, not BRT. Let's say there's a massive influx of money. That means I get two non-BRT and everything else goes to potentially BRT. That, that, that isn't following the spirit of the intent, which is where I would rather see a cap on the number of BRT projects we're going to fund that then if there's extra influx, we can push elsewhere. I know, I know that you know, who does BRT projects in the region? There's, there's conversations about the, of why, why there's a preference, but I think the other way is the intent of what we originally did. So I just want to provide that context because that was done six years ago now. Yeah. So it's been a while. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Member Martinson. So this goes back to, I think, Chris, I think you were the one that raised the, the suggestion originally to say instead of having an absolute number because it's possible, we don't know, <laughs> it's possible that there will be other 
uh, influxes, uh, boluses of money that will show up that will mean non-standard amount, <laughs> right, that we're dealing with. So making it a relative, right, making it a percentage to say, and now we'll still have to have the discussion about, okay, what percentage of transit funding should go to BRT versus what percentage should go to something else. But I think a percentage makes it clear, and I'm all for clarity, right? So I, I would, I guess I would, I don't know that that's maybe been take that maybe that's been taken off for other reasons that we haven't discussed, but. I'm okay with the number of projects too, but that still seems like it locks you into something where we, if we have a different amount total to be dealing with in the future, we're still kind of locked in if we've already set a number. And I guess I would also want a caveat in there to say, presuming that those projects also score well, but I mean, maybe that, maybe that's, maybe that doesn't need to be said, but it seems being explicit about that might be useful. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, member. Uh, we're gonna go Anderson, Johnson, Dugan. I guess I just uh, I'd like to say that that I think this recommendation makes a lot of sense um, I, I, to Commissioner Holberg's um, concern. I think it just removes that dollar amount. So you, you, we may decide that BRT is not working as well in the future as it we think it is today. We you know you walk around the Skyway and there's not much here. There's you know you, downtown Minneapolis, same thing. We don't know when that's coming back if it's coming back. So we may want to sh think about shifting our transportation dollars to projects that make more sense. And maybe this does make sense in the long run, but this gives us that flexibility. And I think it, uh, if we have at least two non-BRT projects that are funded, it, it can, that doesn't put a cap on anything. It, it, it leaves us flexible and open to meet what we see are the future needs. You know, five years ago, the needs seemed different than they seem today. Thank you, Member Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, there's a, I mean, a lot of swirling questions about how this would actually look. Um, if there is time at our next meeting, it, it feels like this could be sort of a stress test. You know, like give us sort of how this might be operating and then say, here's some different scenarios about what this would mean. If there's a giant influx of money that comes in, what's the ramification for BRT projects? You know, one thing that I think even if you have this number of projects, that's still incumbent upon what gets submitted in the first place. And currently, Metro Transit is the only group submitting BRT projects. So if Metro Transit only submits one project, it doesn't really change anything. You know, if other agencies start to, or, you know, again, I know there's a conversation in the South Metro to have with BRT. You know, I think that starts to get into how rigid is this simply because of what gets submitted for the projects. So I know the BRT issue, I believe, back when the decision was made was because BRT was scoring just so well that it would sweep the category yes, if they were submitted. I mean, if my understanding is you know, incorrect about that. So I, I guess it gets to the categories. I mean, it's very difficult for you know, roadways to compete versus bridges because they're such different projects. You know, our BRT lines just so different from the other transit projects, they should actually be separated out and we treat them separately. So I think this is something that's really challenging for us to answer for the 2024 in two months. Uh, it seems like this is more of a 26 and regional solicitation, you know, major overhaul question. But I think the in the interim though, I, I think the actual cap of 32 million is just, again, that's the most rigid part I see on this. So even if that was changed to percentage, I would go back to that being like a really good maybe interim compromise. Thank you for that. I just want to clarify that um, Metro Transit is not the only one that submits BRT. Sorry, you're correct. Yeah, you're correct. so I just yes. want to clarify that. Cole. <coughs> thank, you thank you for that clarification. You know, another important clarification here is remember, ABRT is a separate category. Mm -hmm. We're talking about how this rule applies primarily to non arterial BRT projects. So the projects colors. like Orange Line, Red Line, <laughs> Gold Line, Purple Line. Yeah. So those are the projects that are gonna be most affected by this rule, not arterial BRT. They are not applying for arterial, T, or BR, arterial BRT projects because they have a separate category to fund those. So this rule actually filtered down primarily to the red line this last cycle. And the, the applicants were not Metro Transit, they were MVTA in Dakota County. And then Washington County also applied for projects. So just a clarification there. Yeah, so I guess a quick follow-up then on this is, you know, again, it talks about the, the bus rapid transit limit as the category for number four, but then it talks about the ABRT specifically for this. I think this is just one of those, the, the terminology is very challenging for what gets funded. I know even for the 2022 regional solicitation, there was a project, I believe it was for the red line, that was not about the actual line itself. It was about improvements for that 
corridor, and that was considered a BRT project. So I think there's just a lot of it that's very challenging for us, especially in this room with you know, mm -hmm. lots of us just trying to figure out what this actually means, to really give you the feedback you maybe need for this. I think this is incredibly challenging for us to do. Well, thank you, Member Johnson. I think and can I, and that's, that was my point of clarification. The arterial BRT lines are very successful. They're cost effective. They're being used and the legislature is funding them, okay, very, very well. And so, I mean, the red line is anemic. At one point, its subsidy was higher than the North Star per passenger, is how bad that one was. Orange line, I don't know what the numbers are, but we've asked for an update uh, at uh, 35 Solutions Alliance, but every time I pass those buses, there's virtually nobody on them. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, there has to be some performance standards here, too, at some point mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. We're going to go to Member Dugan, then Bar Barnes and Barber, and then Hollingshead. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I may be permitted to join Member Geist without memory lane, uh, the, I remember this decision well that was, uh, and, and perhaps uh, Director Carlson could also, uh, if I go off, Base, yes, we were funding um, the maximum federal reward for, for this type of project was seven million. Still, still today. So we were, we were going again. You know, for the probably starts back in what 2014, Chris, 2016. Seven million, seven million, seven million, and Metro Transit couldn't get one project going. I mean, and the policy decision was made. This can make a really big impact on transportation in the, in, in, particularly in the core city. Let's you know, put our money where our mouth is. But if I also may, you know, def uh, defer to Member Anderson and Member Holberg, we have to be able to change because, you know, BRT, ABRT solves something then <clears throat> may not be in five years. So, but I'm not sure I'm whether sure we do it by project or money, but it was, you know, 777 mm -hmm. plus mm -hmm. 7, and that's where the magic 32, it should actually be 35. Mm -hmm. We settled at 32. That yeah. was... What, 2016. Geez, the ones that are Got it. So it was a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, if I may, it was a determined policy decision. Um, that, that, thank you. So sounds, thank you, Madam Chair. But good timing to revisit. Uh, things have changed. Uh, Member Barnes. Uh, Madam Chair, just a, a comment to this, and I, I do think whatever comes out here, the more flexibility, whether it's in the the amount, is is going to help. Um, you know was brought up by Commissioner Gotell about, you know, the, the cities and the, the county when it comes to the extra pieces between stations, we also see that. I mean, we're, we're seeing where, you know, just as an example, the F-Line is, is one where we have a Pell study on 47 and 65. You know, the, what's going to come out of that, it could be anywhere from a $50 million from our, our project. I'm not talking about the F line. It can be $50 million up to several hundred million, depending on whether it's a reconstruction. So, you know, I'm not saying that that should be on the back of the F line. There's timing issues, but there are things when you bring in the partnerships to, to have it where the dollars, you know, all of a sudden, you know, very effective. We're, you know, very supportive of, you know, the BRT. There's, <laughs> but it's going to be one where it's not, you know, there's going to be a big investment and you don't want to have it where you get kind of hands tied. Some of these may ultimately, it's kind of like I look at it now, when we do a road project, it's not just a road project. We do bike, pad, 88, we do a lot of other things. Some of these now as we're looking forward, so what I'm bringing up is probably our thinking ahead now. We probably got a bunch of them that were, were done that as we're going forward, there may be two to three times the amount of work to the roadway that's gonna be needed um, from that. So again, from this aspect, you're only talking about this today, more flexibility, not capping, having it where you're trying to line up a lot of things. Um, like again, using the F line, you don't want to spend a lot of money and then we come in and rip it up or right. vice versa. Oh, we put in a lot of money and then you come in and rip it up. So that's the stuff where we're just going to need to work through. Yeah. Flexibility. Thank you. Um, we've got Barbara and then Hollingshead. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just there are a couple of things. Um, so to the point about the ABRT and the 25 million that we set aside um, for those projects going forward. Um, yes, we are getting funding um, through bonding um, at the legislature and hopefully it looks on the street. Uh, promising this time as well. But a big reason why we've been successful with that is because the, um, of the effort that we put forth here um, showing that we're willing to commit money to and um, through this project project or process. And the next line that's up is the H line, which um, the cost estimate is about, it's a much longer line. So the cost estimate is about 105 million um, for that. And so, you know, showing that we're also willing to put money, I think helps when they're arguing for that bonding money, money at the legislature that we're willing to look at this holistically from a regional perspective. Um, just a couple of comments on some of the ridership numbers. Yes, some of the commuter numbers are still down. Um, Orange Line has been um, um, doing better than some of the others, but I think that's just where it's at. Um, and uh, right now it's not running at the full frequency that we wanted to. But our ABRCT system is back to pre-pandemic levels. So like we need to keep reminding ourselves that we are very successful at some of this and need to, um, to, to really, quite frankly, with this group, I think taking up, just stepping up and taking a stand to build those lines and have, be, have an active role in it has really shown the region and the states kind of why <laughs> these things are important. And I think it's an area where we're becoming a leader in the country on, on ABRT systems. Um, to the, the comments from um, uh, Member Barnes and, and Commissioner Cattell about local <clears throat> improvements, um, I think we need to be careful and make sure that we keep project costs, project costs, but also continue to work in partnership because again, you don't wanna tear things up once, you wanna improve things once. Um, but if we start doing too much scope creep on these projects, then they become less cost effective. But there's, you know, ways that we can work together, per, you know, perhaps in timing of if there are other, other pedestrian improvements, then there's other pedestrian options included in regional solicitation where we can work together on op applications or things like that. Thank, Thank you. you. Member Hollington. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, when we did this in 2016 or whenever it was, uh, we were in a different um, commuting, commuting world, um, pre-pandemic. It was, and the AB, ABRT system, except for the A line, the very first line was hub and spoke. It was downtown. Um, the A line is crosstown. And BRT could be a lot more crosstown because it could run on 494 or, or 62 or any of the uh, sort of Beltline roads that we have. So I would like to see included in this proposal a discussion of how we get to a more crosstown model that is maybe more, a little bit more appropriate post-pandemic, but also serves the longstanding, um, I don't live in the suburbs, but I, I sympathize strongly with the suburbs. Uh, is there a role for more investment in BRT crosstown in the suburbs, not just the A-line in the cities or something like that? So as a transit user and a, and a transit representative, I'd like to see some discussion of crosstown versus hub and spoke in this. And, and what do we do with the numbers and the money uh, that could move us more toward a grid, more toward a, a system that serves um, community to community instead of everything going through downtown. Thank you, Mad yeah. Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Hollingshead. I'm gonna go to Member Dugan and then I'm gonna move us to the next slides because we still got four more on this topic. So. I'll, I'll be very quick. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. In, in, when that yeah. policy decision was, was made, uh, and Steve, correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we were also looking at how other MPOs handled, handled their money, and I believe it was Denver that does only two or three or three or four major projects to make an impact as opposed to we, our, our approach. And I think that was part of the thinking, <clears throat> okay, let's try to zero in on something and get it done for the, for the betterment of the transit system and, the, and its ridership. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you uh, for everyone's comments. Well, some of these we're gonna have to come back with. I think that's apparent that yeah, yes, we gotta do some more work on them, come back. And so uh, we'll just touch on some of these other ones just to, give you a flavor for what the technical committees are working on. Uh, we did talk about minimum point value. That was something that was brought up at this committee. 
Um, I think it's more of a 2026 option. Again, we're going to be down 100 million. We had 350, 350 million last time, so that maybe skewed things a little bit with going down those lists. Um, so the technical committees aren't aren't advocating for a change um, in the recommendation coming back to you, but we can talk about that more next time if we need to. Uh, one topic that came up several times, and I, I've heard it today a few times, is the increase of of costs on projects and. We haven't, many of these minimum or maximum awards haven't changed for several cycles. And our partners are experiencing a huge cost, cost inflation. Um, and we've got some of those numbers from MINDAP. But uh, so there is a appetite, at least from the technical committees, to look at these maximum awards and um, think about increasing them by some percentage or some amount, um, either across the board or uh, some of these categories. So. Uh, if there's any feedback on that particular topic, I think we will talk about it tomorrow at F&P, but I uh, wanted to make sure Tab wanted, wanted us to get into it, too. Yes. Yep. Uh, Member Linda Keith, please. I'd be interested in seeing, like, inflation projections when these numbers were set 10 years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. How much would that dollar value be worth mm -hmm. today? And I think we'd yeah. be shocked by the results of that. <laughs> so um, I, that'd be some information I'd like. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So, you know, from, and MnDOT, and Mike, Mike can correct me if I'm wrong here, but, uh, you know, going back to 2000, MnDOT's seen about 5% per year inflation, construction inflation. The last four years, it's been more like 8%. So, yeah, so, but let's see numbers. So, 7 yep. million in 2005 would equal what today? And I, I just like to see that in yep. a category on this chart. Yeah. Thank you. Can um, be done? Member, thank you. Yeah. So you'll have to get a mathematician in or something. I remember I could tell. <laughs> well, first I want to go back to, um, to to quickly to question five and just make a quick comment that you know at this point you know I'd like to make sure that um, we just keep it where it is and you know have a further discussion about you know a minimum threshold of points right points right now I I don't. I don't, county doesn't support that at this point. On the, on the federal minimum maximum awards, I think we have to revisit this with everything we've seen on all the projects and everything. And I would be, it would be nice to be looking at something that is relevant to today's costs and everything like this. This has this has impacted everyone here sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Geisler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think if you're revisiting the maximum award, we should also visit the maximum percentage of a project funding. Because there are some projects that are under the maximum that are getting 80% of their funding from TAB funds. And there are some projects that are getting hitting the hard dollar cap and getting 25% of their funds. And those are those two caps we hit. We never talk about the 80% cap. I know that's part of the federal. Yep. That's the maximum the feds allow. We can pull the number down if we wanted to. Because the, the conversation about if we raise the maximum on the federals, all the big projects eat the money and all the little projects don't get anything, which brings us back to who's getting the money, regional balance, are we spreading the money around, are we trying to do big splashes, what are we, like, those are, those are top level policy conversations. So if we want to accommodate, like we did with strategic capacity saying, we know these things are much more expensive, so we're gonna raise the cap. But even if you look at those, all of them that are hitting $10, 10 million, they're getting less than 50% of their funding from TAB. But a lot of the bike pad are getting 80% of their funding from TAB for that project. So the question, I think, should be more of how much should TAB be funding of a percentage of a project in concept? Is it 80% or is it less? Yep, good. You've, you've hit the, the nail on the head on the policy questions there. So I think overall we're about 50%. TAB is funding about 50% of the total project costs if you add up all the categories. But... It varies wildly from probably 20% yeah. to 80%. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm hearing this is something people want to talk about yeah. more. Yes. Okay, and then lastly, and we'll uh, move it over to um, Adam Harrington's presentation. We did want to mention that there, there is an opportunity, and it's actually right, um, it's open right now for people to make changes to the um, Regional Bicycle Transportation Network. Again, that's one of a, the major scoring items in the multi-use trails uh, application category. So. Uh, the council is accepting, and you can see the, the three bullet points here, the types of changes to that RBTN system. But uh, for the technical folks, this was very important that they knew exactly what could be um, amended or re revised going into the cycle. So um, you have it on the slide now. And uh, if you have further questions, um, feel free to reach out to myself or others. 
Right. Thank you, Steve. Madam Chair. Yes. I just have one additional item. Um, you know, we haven't talked about the elephant in the room, if you will, and how the last solicitation barely passed and mm -hmm. one person voting and another way it would have been a tied vote and whether or not these goals reflect regional goals or sub-regional goals. Um, one of the things that Dakota County would like to have a discussion is if um, we are able to submit the trail portions of our road expansion projects separately. We feel like it's very, very difficult to get any money uh, for roads under the, these criterion process, but that um, if we could bisect or segment the road and trail, because we put eight foot trails on both sides of these roads yeah. and all the pedestrian, but not, you know, so I would like the technical committee or somebody to at least have a discussion around that as a strategy for at least funding the trail parts of road projects in the growing areas. Okay, well, do. Thank you. We'll be back again. We've got one more month as an information item, so we're I think we'll zero in on a few of these topics next month, and then the following month is the action item. Thanks for your. Oh yeah. So we do have uh, we've got some people that looked up the inflation adjust adjustment from 2005. Uh, Seven million dollars turns into 10.7 million dollars. So eats away pretty quick. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Adam, you're up. <clears throat> you see it on here? Right there. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. I'm Adam Harrington. I'm the Director of Service Development at Metro Transit, and I'm here to talk about some of the changes that have occurred in our system over the past three years. So I've got a number of slides to help me do that, and this first slide really summarizes where we've been and where we're at. A lot of information here, but I want to first talk about the bar chart. And the bar chart starts in August 2019 and ends in March 2023 on the right. There's three time periods to pay attention to here. One is the first three bars on the left, the level that they're at. Uh, the bars in the middle between June 2020 and August 2021, and then everything after August 2021. Um, so there's the pre-COVID area, the year that we had a uh, number of changes in play with our system responding to public health guidance relative to COVID. And then after August 2021, largely everything we did was in response to workforce shortages. Uh, and when you look at that first set of bars, the yellow line on this diagram shows the level of scheduled service that we provide how many operators we need to operate that service. The red line is the number of operators we actually have. So we were short before the pandemic, but the nature of the work we were short in was mostly part-time bus operators. And so there's a little bit more flexibility to get that covered. When we first entered into the pandemic three years ago this month, and only a few days from now when it actually officially hit here, uh, we reduced our service down to as low as 60% system-wide as we responded to the stay at home orders and some of the restrictions that were in play in the first 15 days. Uh, the bar chart on here and the first note of June 2020 is the first actual full scheduled system data set that reflects uh, where we were at. And so you can see it was about 74% of the scheduled service compared to August 2019, which we're calling our 100% base for this purpose. Uh, and we've gone up and down a number of times and in August 2021, we were expecting that a number of the restrictions have been lifted, a number of changes have happened. There was talk about people wanting to get back to the regular travel patterns. And so we did add a little bit of service for August right before fall when we typically see a growth pattern in our travel patterns and ridership. Uh, but it wasn't long before we were actually in August. Uh, remember, we make these scheduled changes a few months ahead of time, so we're anticipating. But the, by the time we got there, uh, we were losing more operators and not able to hire them. So it's at a workforce the size that we have of 1,200 at the time. Uh, the attrition rate is always going, right? You have a workforce of 1,200. You're always losing some people with the retirement and taking different jobs and other things. 
and replace them with hiring new people. Well, we weren't able to hire new people and uh, we then entered into a little bit of a slide for the next year as we tried to manage our service. So our, our main message here is we develop our service plan and the routes and schedules is we wanna make sure that what we tell our customers, we actually deliver. So reliability is the name of the game. If we say a trip is gonna be there at 8.05 in the morning, we wanna make sure it's there. But that means making hard decisions about reducing our scheduled service, which impact our customers as well. Uh, so that's a long way of painting the picture here. Now I'm gonna share a few slides about how we're responding to it. Uh, the first thing is how do we get more operators and <coughs> Anyone here that deals with an operations type of service, whether it's maintenance or snow plowing or deliveries or anything, knows it's been a challenge across the board. And our area is not unique to this. Every transit property across the country has had similar problems. And we've tried a lot of different things to improve the attractiveness of coming to Metro Transit and bringing operators in and really helping people get their commercial driver's license. Uh, but it wasn't until the council approved a big starting wage increase last October and a hiring bonus that we started to see more traction on more applicants coming in that wanted to try out being a bus operator. So since that time forward, we've been able to hire more operators. We've had a lot more attention to it. And uh, as you'll see this March, uh, our pick that's going into play this Saturday is the first pick in a year that we haven't had service reductions because we've been able to hire operators. So we're slowly moving forward on this. But over the course of this whole time, the last year since August 2021, again, we wanna be reliable with our service. If we can't be reliable, we're gonna lose attractiveness and ridership. So we use these guiding principles to help us think through where and when we reduce our services, looking at how we, what the alternatives are. Do people have parking opportunities? Is there frequency opportunities? Is there other routes people can, can take that might require a transfer? And then how does that impact our ridership compared to the capacity we actually have on our buses out on the road? Uh, and then of course, balancing the coverage of our network all through this process. Um, on the diagram on the right, you can see what's on our website right now showing the number of routes that are currently suspended. <coughs> and there's a lot of commuter express routes that are suspended and of course that's something you would see when a lot of those commuters are working remotely and now they have the option to do so moving forward. So it's been a challenge for us and we continue to focus on our, our local market here. Uh, and we're always looking at how our network is changing. And this is a 10 year look at our ridership patterns by route type. And I'm gonna talk about each one of these colors a little bit. The green line is the local bus ridership system wide. And you can see there have been some changes between 2014 and 2020. And then when the pandemic hit, everything went down. But you can see also we're starting to grow back. And that's a good sign. And the same thing is true with the purple line, which is LRT ridership. We're starting to come back on that category as well. The red line, which is commuter express bus, is not coming back so strong. And there is a little bit of a chicken and the egg, but we do a lot of work with our downtown partners to better understand are people coming back? Are you encouraging them to come back? How do we balance that out um, to provide that service? But we're also limited in operators, so there's only so much we can do as we prioritize our, our service. So I just wanna go through a few images, a lot of lines on the map. So this is just an image of what our route system looked like in 2019. You can see the extent of the coverage. Uh, the colors aren't so important for this presentation, but the green lines are the commuter express routes, and largely the purple and blue lines are local routes. The purple are contracted, and the blue are operated by Metro Transit. These are the routes and segments that have been suspended. This is just showing where those are. So you can see it's pretty evenly distributed across the region. And then when we look at other reductions we've had to make over the course of time, the line width just shows you the proportion of trip reductions that have been made. So again, this really reflects where those opportunities are in our system and frankly, where there's been more reductions, there was more service to draw from as well. But we still have a strong system. This is what we're looking like today from a network standpoint and we're gonna to continue to build on that. So we're 
we're pretty happy with where we're at right now as a foothold to build from, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we're going to do that. Uh, but we have had a number of things that we've done in the midst of all this. We added Orange Line, albeit not at the frequency that we wanted to or had planned to because of the uh, shortage of operators. We just started D-Line last September, which has been doing very well. And uh, so how do we communicate those things? We always have good communication with our customers. We strive to make sure they know what's going on and tell them about these changes, whether they're positive or negative. Again, March 2023, this Saturday, scheduled changes go into play, and we're not having any scheduled reductions. Um, but the one big thing we are doing this quarter is opening our new bus garage, the North Loop Garage. Here's an image of it from the nighttime sky, and we're really excited about starting our service out of this garage. Uh, it's centrally located in downtown Minneapolis, right next to our Haywood garage near Target Field. This map can give you a sense of where those changes are from our operating facilities. The green plus signs are where our garages are located, including the FTH is the Fred T. Haywood garage in downtown Minneapolis next to the North Loop. And we're closing the MJR, the Martin J. Reuter garage up in Brooklyn Center to revenue service as part of this change. One of the things that we deal with annually at Metro Transit, and we want to work closely with our city, county, and MnDOT partners is how we manage construction projects. And certainly, we can anticipate probably a lot more construction after this winter that was not planned. Uh, but a couple projects that are planned are construction in downtown St. Paul for a couple of projects. So again, we're partnering with the city to help us think through the timing of this. And we add, we add operators and trips and hours of service to our schedules to be able to navigate these these different detours. And so it's a mix of how do we manage the service and how we communicate to our customers. Osseo Road between North Minneapolis and Brooklyn Center is a Hennepin County project. This is gonna be a great project when it's all done, but it's a primary link between North Minneapolis and Brooklyn Center. So it's a fairly large detour that we'll be implementing when that project begins this summer. However, we're now at a place where we can start to think about growing back. We've already added a few trips back here and there in our system. I expect we'll be incrementally growing over the course of this year. Uh, we have a budget to add another 200 operators if we were able to. Uh, and I don't know that we'll be able to, but that's our goal, and hopefully we can do that. So as we think through this and look forward to the next five years, we wanna be able to add to our service and think about where those priorities are and develop scenarios for how we can do that. And so Network Now is a project that we're embarking on right now. And you'll be hearing more about this if you haven't already, but it's a project to really look at where we can add service and how we can fit the pieces together. So first we're doing a values and principles survey. So we've got some survey informa information out that I'll leave on the screen at, on the last slide. We'll be collecting that information along with all the customer feedback from our stakeholders to help us think through what are the values and principles we want to apply to building our system out for the next five years or so. Uh, we're gonna be confirming the network of today. Remember all those suspended routes that I showed on that slide? How do we wanna deal with those moving forward? We really need to set a base and probably move away from calling 2019 our base, but have a spot to grow from. So uh, we'll be doing that. And then we'll really be getting, rolling up our sleeves and proposing places to add service in the network. And I have a public process surrounding that as well and ultimately have a plan in summer, spring, summer of 2024. So what is included are changes to existing routes, suspended routes, um, the span of service, the frequency of service. We're not gonna be changing the alignments of any transit ways. Uh, we're not looking at fair policy changes, new capital projects. This isn't part of the TPP planning effort, although it'll be a good input to, to it from our standpoint. So just want to be able to clarify what types of things uh, will be in our Network Now project. And then lastly, uh, this is our survey. We've got it live right now. This is the agency survey, the one that's on our website at metrotransit.org slash network now is kind of general public customer survey, but this one here, if you have the presentation, that link is in there and uh, you can 
use this code to go directly to the survey. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? I have a question to start and then I'll move around the table, but I'm wondering if you are going to take into account new travel patterns post COVID, um, you know, as people are working from home, but then are using transit to do other things as part of this process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's a great question. That's really the fundamental piece to the project is thinking about what are the new ways people are moving around? What are their new trip patterns? Certainly the office commute is a big component of that, but also the all day service nature of how do we provide service to our customers who use it not just for their work trip, but for their trip to school, their trip to the grocery <laughs> store, the clinic or whatnot. So that's a big part of how we do that. Uh, we're not abandoning the commuter express network, but we really need to work with our downtown partners in particular to understand how are they encouraging people to come back? What are the corridors that we should be focusing on to build that service out? So those are some of the things we're thinking about. I guess I'm getting at less of a, how are we encourage people to come back and adjusting for actual behavior changes post COVID, yes. because I don't think we're going to have the encouragement to come back in the way that we did, or we have changes in you know two days a week or three days a week, but that we're going to actually use those the existing behaviors not trying to change behavior, but the existing behavior so that we can do future planning. Madam Chair, yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, I took the slide out that showed the different modes and how much we're investing in each one, but the commuter express route is quite a bit smaller than it was. And, Madam Chair, just to that point, sure. when I hear you say working with our downtown partners, you should be working with your suburban people to learn more about their changes. This isn't a downtown issue because that's done. Like, so I don't know. It just seems very backwards. Yeah, thank Madam you. Madam Chair, for me. <clears throat> Questions, I'm going to start with Member Foster and then Karwaski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay. First, I really appreciate the operator recruitment that's been happening. I have been seeing and been skipped by a lot of, like, route in training, new <laughs> operator in training. So while I am frustrated by my bus, by seeing a bus go by me, it's nice to know that it is working. I do have a comment on the slide on the adjusting requirements. You say that you've removed the high school GED requirement, which is great. That is not reflected on the website. Okay. It still calls for that as a requirement. So that should be updated. Um, what is red kite support? <clears throat> Madam Chair. Uh, remember, it's a great question. Red Kite is a training for first responders. It's originally developed for firefighters and uh, paramedics. That is how you cope with difficult situations and how you respond to them and how you can react and manage yourself through those both before, during, and after. And so we've been able to adapt that at Metro Transit for our, our operation staff as well. Okay. Can I ask? Yep, please. I also just want to follow up on what I have several said about not focusing on how are we going to continue to bring people back downtown and if we continue to focus on building out the transit system around that, it's going to fail. And it's not just going to fail like the region, it's going to fail individual people and this has impact beyond just building out a bus system, it has impact on if the state's gonna prioritize public transit and addressing climate change. So just, just wanna strongly encourage to refocus who you're talking to, who you're prioritizing when you're having conversations about system development. So. Manage, I might, so. Kind of responding to both. Maybe I'm overemphasizing it because it's such the biggest change that we have in our system. We have, I think, 50 plus commuter routes that are suspended, and so there's a lot of attention to it. But certainly over the past three years, we've spent a lot of time focusing on how we strengthen those local networks. And that is important. Both are important. It's we have to make it the right fit because we probably aren't going to see the same level of express service yeah. that we did before, but it's going to be different. So we need to think about where those things are. And so maybe it's suburban destinations, maybe it's downtown. Uh, hopefully downtowns don't go away altogether because that could be a, a big problem for everybody, I think, economically. But there's a, there's a shift, certainly, and we're, we're intent on being responsive to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Member Karawaski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Adam, thanks for 
presenting and giving the update. Um, I'm happy that you're able to make progress with getting employees, as uh, mentioned by um, Member Foster. Uh, surprised you're able to make so much progress with an only a dollar and a half raise. Um, so I th really think the key uh, to increasing that ridership is dependable routes with drivers. But with this said, moving forward, you mentioned all these maps. And you mentioned the comment that if you look at the map, the service is really well-rounded throughout the metro, I think was about your term. I would argue that if you do an arc around Minneapolis, probably 80% of the resources are put in there. I'd be curious if you put the same arc around St. Paul, if what's the per capita service What's the mile and frequency of the routes? I think that data would be very valuable. And I do think that it's, you have to reach out to the uh, ring counties. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I think maybe coming here more than, uh, maybe you don't have to come here yearly, but with you know every year and a half to get an update like this would be really valuable. But I think if you reached out to the ring counties, Maybe they could develop a system that uh, Commissioner Aura can mention the micro transit. I think of that as maybe the short buses. Uh, I really think we need to go a long way on circulator buses, micro transit out to a broader reach. Many of those people want to come downtown, so it's, I don't think it's in dispute. Of Commissioner uh, Member Foster's point. Um, I just think we need to make strides, intentional strides. We have our own. Beyond Ramsey, you know, Ramsey and Hennepin are vital, but I really think we really need to reach out to the Ring County. So if that process could be done, started on a more frequent basis or be truthful, I don't think it really happens at all. Madam Chair, yes. uh, member, I think it's a great point, and hopefully everyone's agency here has received a notification for an agency, series of agency meetings that are April 11th, 12th, and 13th. And so you're all invited to participate in that and certainly take the this, this survey because the question of what, what, the, what are the values, should we be looking at our service at a we had a one time in there of cost per capita. Should that be a factor in how we decide where we allocate additional service? So definitely take the survey because those are the exact kind of things we want to learn from people and take that into consideration. So on the when we compare changes to your point about whether or not it's well-rounded, uh, my point is to the system that exists today and in 2019, <coughs> they're scaled about evenly between the two. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Member Gotel. Thank you, and I appreciate my colleagues' comments so far. And I, I want to thank you, too, for all the hard work that you're doing on trying to um, get more reliability and restoring service and what you're doing with uh, the transit bus drivers and just your transit in general. I think it's it's having some kudos. Um, I heard from our Met council rep how many people were coming <coughs> through your classes. So congratulations and kudos to that. I think you've got a winning um, strategy there uh, addressing the driver shortages. You know, I, I really think it's important, though, I think, to prioritize safety, and I know you're still working on this, your security for the transit riders, but also for the operators, and I know you have a new chief coming on, um, need to hit the floor running. I know you're working really hard, and I know other jurisdictions are adding in and trying to help as well, so whatever we can do, let's find a way forward so that more people feel safe and that there's a different, um, a diff there are different comments coming off of Twitter and other feeds and Facebook and things like this about about transit and riding the uh, light rail. Um, I'd also 
encourage the Metro Transit to improve information sharing related to schedule changes and general messaging. So it's clear um, with people for with low vision issues. That's what we're, we're getting some feedback from the disability community that they cannot see those changes and that we need to be thinking about some of them. They're really reliant on, on transit. So if we could help them out more, that'd be great. Also inc um, encourage Metro Transit to including additional scope beyond the stop locations, including pedestrian transit and roadway connections nearby or adjacent to transit stops to ensure first and last mile connections because that's what stops some people from you know taking transit is those last mile connections you know especially with people with limited mobility issues we really need to be cognizant of those kinds of pieces so um, thank you this was a really good um, presentation and look forward to seeing what happens here in the future thank you uh, Hol member Holbert did, were you done with comments? I had to. No, uh, we're just trying to find out the locations and dates in totally. April, and we can't oh. find it here on the website. Okay, so. thank you. I, I can send that out to the group. That would be fantastic. Thank group, you. So everyone has Excellent. Their own. Excellent. Member Jenkins. So um, one of the things we've seen, and I understand it from the pandemic perspective, is we've gotten very reactionary. Um, one of the things I'd like to hear about or, or see uh, met, Metro Transit do, is also, how do you drive some of the change? Um, one of the things I want to address that a number of members have already talked about is, you know, you'd be a fool to say downtowns are going to look the same in 20 years as they did five years ago. Um, and in deference to some of the other members, I would probably not talk about downtowns. I would talk about business centers, because some of our out, outer counties have very large business districts as well. But one of the things that I want to make sure we're looking at is, while the downtowns and the business districts will look different, there's still an opportunity to drive ridership in the new work environment. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is work from home. Not everyone is work in the office. A lot of people are hybrid. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an opportunity to say, you know what? If your business lets you work from home three days a week, great. But you know what? When you need to get in to go to that meeting, we're here to help you. That's right. It may not be a 8 a.m. or 5 p.m. ride, though. Maybe it's at lunch hour to go in for the afternoon on that day to attend a meeting or something. So I think there's some opportunities for us to also drive into that change that we see happening, not just wait, because as we know on this committee, you know, changes aren't going to happen in the next one month, <laughs> you know. Um, so that's one of the things I'd just ask that we look at as opportunity as well. Thank you, Member Jenkins. Member Lindeke. Oh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, I wanted to say I'm really, oh, on the safety issue, I think we should all be tuning into the conversation at the legislature. Yes. Oh, yeah. um, there's a couple bills in the mm -hmm. House uh, that are in, in committee right now that are really critical to building ridership. And so the, most, the more you can lean on folks at the Capitol to help with that, I think the better. But I really like this Network Now project. I think it's just what we need to be talking about with Metro Transit. So um, I just commend you for, for having that conversation. It's a lot of the same stuff we're talking about, but thinking about it sort of proactively is great. Um, I kind of want to complain a little bit about something that doesn't really appear on your charts, which is like frequency issues. Uh, so the green line, you know, which I take every day, you know, has run four trips an hour instead of six, and that's been the case for a while. So um, it just has a big impact on how much that ridership can bounce back at the University of Minnesota, seeing the students, you know, I know how lazy they are and how much they cut, cut you know, cut the time between classes, and if that train's only coming every 15 minutes, it really impacts the amount of ridership you can bring back. Um, so the kind of triage you've been doing over the last two years is really admirable, but um, focusing on core service like that, I think, is really something you should make a high priority. Um, then the only other comment I was wondering about was how much you can use speed or the shift from commuter to all-day service to help alleviate um, the operator shortages. So switching from split shifts to eight hour shifts, you know, have, how, how much has that helped at all? Or as you've been juggling where you're putting drivers, um, 
is that a kind of solution that is, is just theoretical or is it actually on the ground you're able to shift priorities and, and use one person in a different way than you were before? How much has that been a thing? Madam Chair, uh, member, the challenge is, is the type of bus operator we have. If they're designated a part-time operator, there's limitations on that. Uh, now, over the past three years, the proportion of bus operators that are part-time is much, much smaller than it was, so there's more full-time bus operators. But we are looking at ways to more creatively change those uh, schedules around that might better meet the customer demand. Uh, it's probably not enough for the scale that we've had to deal with over the past years, nor are any speed and reliability improvements, which we have done on a number of corridors, speed and reliability improvements, and it really helps make the ride smooth, it gets you a little bit faster, and more importantly, gets you the same time every day. And those are the important features that we really want, and we're going to continue to build on speed and reliability and see if we can do better at that as well. Thank you. Member Barber. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, um, I love this conversation. This is great. I really want to thank all of our staff at Metro Transit. Um, the hardest thing for anybody at a transit agency is to sh have to cut service because it's really not what you want to do. But we made a very concerted, <clears throat> focused effort that reliability was the key thing to make sure that even though it was on reduced frequency or reduced um, lines, you knew when you got there there was going to be service. And so that's really where we felt we needed to focus. That said, we're finally getting a turnaround in some of our um, operator hiring. Uh, we've been very creative, had some great events recently. I think it's been, it's, uh, it's obviously seen. I'm really happy to see you're seeing lots of trainees mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. That just brings me great joy. Um, um, so some of the other comments about the changes in ridership, um, this is something we're factoring in. This is, you know, a few years ago, you probably remember us talking about Network Next. Well, we put that on hold. You know, we focused on our AVRT stuff for that, put the rest of it on hold until after because we knew things were going to change. And we have seen changes. Um, and um, we're, you're not seeing morning and, and PM peaks. You're seeing peaks later in the day, like at 11 and it's and throughout the day. And you can see that in some of our ridership numbers. Um, um, I, I got an unfortunate um, uh, Commissioner Holberg left, but like um, Red Line has about 400 riders a day. Orange Line, which connects more through um, Minneapolis and the South Metro, is 1,600. The D Line is 8,500 a day. And so those are people who are doing these errands and running and things in between in between meetings, maybe going to work, maybe not going to work, but using it for a lot of different purposes. Um, and then for transit safety, um, the other thing I wanted to touch on, um, and thank you, Member Lindicky, for bringing up the, the bills that are moving through. Um, we've cleaned lots of good vocal voices um, and just want to thank a lot of our local partners that are helping to step up because um, we also have um, uh, limits on how many officers we have um, available. Everyone's having a hard time hiring. Um, and so, you know, we will freely say that we can use some help. And so we appreciate the willingness to do that. And then finally, um, I will say um, uh, March 22nd is Transit Driver Appreciation Day. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge everyone from TAB to find a transit driver and tell them thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, <laughs> Member Barber. Uh, Member Geisler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Adam, thank you for the presentation today. Again, I, I always love the data you guys bring. It's, it's good and solid. You know, the one, one part I, I'm a little frustrated with, though, is when we're looking at maps of number of trips per, reduced, there's a line that runs down the middle of my town that feeds most people. It was an hour service. So that was, that was the best we were getting at the peak, and it is now down to one bus every three hours. That bus might as well have been suspended. But it shows up as the smallest impact on your charts. But if that was shown as 75% reduction in service for what's there, compared to some of these where, yeah, we dropped 100, 100 pieces, but it's only 5% of the service in the area. That's another lens that I think we need to look at, because as Member Hollins had pointed out, I'm one of those suburban folks who's trying to get around. And I, I've talked to people who are like, yeah, I used to take the bus, but if I miss it at the 9 a.m. bus because it's late or it's early or whatever, I, I miss half my work day, <laughs> no <doubt. laughs> or it's not even possible. And when we're making investments in workforce housing because there's transit line next to it and the transit line evaporates, then it all of a sudden now, I've, now I'm under parked. Now I've got more cars on the street. Now it, we, it creates all these other cascading land use and planning problems. So these are all really tightly interrelated. So I, anything we're gonna, t when you start looking at trimming lines, adding lines back, all those pieces, 
look at the land use changes, look at the development changes <coughs> where cities have consciously built out density in some spaces that now there was service and there isn't. And maybe it wasn't being used, but now it, they just have never had an option. So I, we, we barely get anything on the edges anyway. Edges of your, I mean, it's also worth pointing out that this map doesn't even go to the ends of the counties that this board serves, let alone barely into the edges of the first ring, first ring suburbs. So I, I just challenge you to think about reduction in service as well as reduction in trips because a 75% reduction in service, while well, technically the line's there, isn't really serving them. And I know you guys know that vol frequency matters, but it, it's important for the, the little bit of transit we get on the edges. If it's not there frequently, it's just not worth it. Yeah. Madam Chair, I yeah. think the, the challenge is, and we don't go to the edge of every county. And if I had my transit market area map here, you could see why that is. Yep. And the density matters, right? And so that's part of the factor in here too. And so balancing those challenges between opportunity with new developments and where are they going versus where we're at now. We're thinking about those things as well. All right, Member Johnson. Uh, thank you. I know we're getting towards the end and people have to start leaving, so I will be very quick. Uh, the first question I had is just the, the map that's in this packet is just Metro Transit's routes. So any of the suburban Correct. transit providers are not in there. So I know there was a comment before about, you know, why are you not servicing, you know, some of the, the ring counties? The answer is because there's a suburban transit provider that has that area. Correct. Right. We do contract with Maple Grove Transit, who is a private operator, and we're their operator. But for Southwest Transit, Minnesota Valley, they operate their own service. That's why not. That's why they're not on there. Yeah. Thank you. And I just that was a point of clarification because um, I know it's when I first joined TAB, and even before I was very confused about how do the suburban transit operators you know, work with the <coughs> transit? How does this all work with the maps? So again, I know it's complex. So you know, I'm sure there's somebody else in this room that was also confused about <laughs> where are the other routes. Uh, and the other point just about, I know um, Member Lindicky brought up uh, frequency. I, I think that's a huge deal with headways. I just want to reemphasize that that's, again, very frustrating sometimes when you are going for your bus and then, oh, wait, the next one's not coming for an hour or whatever it is. You know, it, it does kind of make you a lot less apt to think of it as a reliable transportation network. Uh, the one particular one I want to bring up is just the the evenings and into the ev you know, later evening period. You know, I was almost stuck in downtown St. Paul a few weeks ago because missed the last green line out by five minutes, and then how do I get back? You know, it was sort of the big question for me. And I remember, I mean, it wasn't that long ago we had routes that went after midnight, you know, pretty regularly, and and that's gone. And I almost sort of laughed when I saw the. And this again is not on you. I know the difficulties of what it is, but it was you know get your free ride for you know going out on on St. Patrick's Day or for New Year's. And I thought that's fantastic, except for all the routes end well before people are still out at bars. So you know you can get there for your free ride, but getting home not so much. So you know I think there's just some of these issues that again you know when are people using transit? When do we want to encourage them to use transit? I mean, if you're out at the bar on, on St. Patrick's Day, I want them taking transit and not driving. So I think there's just a whole um, collection of things here. And, and again, I'm happy to see some of the buses be much more full. You know, it's just, it's really satisfying to see. I'm glad that the drivers are, are you know, responding to the incentives with the higher um, rates on this. Um, and I know you said before you're budgeted for 200 more drivers. I mean, that gets you back to close to the 2019 number of, of drivers, but you know, is that part-time versus full-time? Like, you know, how close is that back to the peak even if you got those 200? Uh, Madam Chair, member, it's probably about, uh, the, the challenge here is we had a different kind of service and so we needed more operators by count, but we don't need as many when they're full-time. And so it'd be pretty close. We're budgeted to 82% of our service for the system wide right now. We're running 74% today. So we've got about a 10, 15% opportunity for growth. Okay, thank you. We've got three more with their hands up. I know we're over time. Member Hollingshead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what are the data sources now that we're in this new post pandemic? Uh, uh, not as many people going downtown. What are, what are the data sources for the next, uh, uh, um, what is it, the NOW uh, program you're proposing? Is it travel behavior inventory? Is it cell phone data? Is it drivers? Is it former transit riders? Data sets and data categories, I think those matter quite a bit. Um, if we 
want the results to match the current uh, climate and the future climate instead of the past. I'm not talking about climate environmentally. I mean, the, the ridership and the, and the mobility climate. Madam Chair, so we'll be looking at census data, we'll be looking at TBI data when that's available soon. We're gonna be using our customer feedback data operators, the survey, we've got the survey out for this group and for the public. And we're also partnering with different agencies to look at what's the pattern of workforce in office versus hybrid versus remote. We look at parking ramp usage and highway usage that MnDOT has, street light data. So we're gonna be looking at a range of things that fold into how we make decisions adding service back in. Just quickly, I think we do have an opportunity to study mode switch a little bit here because of the different climate that we're in. And so I hope the data reflects that, the data sources reflect that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Adam. This is really helpful. I'm gonna um, support Member Karwaski's request and thought about coming here more frequently, I think. This type of request for data and this insight comes up for many members of this panel. And so um, coming here, whether biannually, quarterly, whatever it might be, would be really valuable. And um, also a plus one to Member Jenkins in terms of the marketing piece. I do think that you see transit and transportation patterns shifting. And so I think to the degree that can be included in your marketing efforts, that is a really powerful message to say the way that you are getting around has changed and the way that we are thinking about providing transport to you has changed and as such it's available to you even though it may look different than what you were used to before my question for you is around the suspended routes both the express and local is there a philosophy as to how you're contemplating returning those and then related to that is the summer and fall of 23 that you laid out the point at which you would decide if any of those routes go away permanently Thank you, Madam Chair. Member, uh, we will be hopefully deciding that this summer or fall. I guess it's summer or fall by the time we get around to our community meetings on what our new base is and what do we do with suspended services. I imagine some of those won't be coming back. Some of them might be in the planning phase. Uh, the nice thing about what we're doing is even if we say we're going to declare this route suspended, it doesn't mean you couldn't ever bring it back someday either. So there's opportunities there when we think about growing our network out. But we will be deciding this summer, fall, what's our base look like so we can make decisions both for our customers and for our facilities and our cities who are partners with us on how are we managing these things moving forward. Thank you. All right, Member Martinson and then Member Koski with the last word. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Adam, thank you for the presentation. I, this is a suggestion that I've made actually to uh, members of the Met Council, but I thought since you're here, I'll make it to you as well. Uh, I, I'm interested to hear more about the micromobility uh, at STA. And the first and last mile question is one that is always an issue. I, I am the non-motorized rep on the tab, so I'm representing my constituents by my constituents. Who do I represent here? But the people I represent on this board, uh, in saying that I would love to see, we, in St. Paul, we have not had a nice ride bike share system since 2019. Minneapolis is apparently losing their nice ride system now. Nice ride bike share systems really should be a regional kind of provision. They should be integrated with the transit system. And I would love to see, I would love to see an integration of a system that was a, that was a publicly run bike share system integrated with our bus and light rail system in a way that would provide that first and last mile. And I think it would have safety improvements as well because a lot of the problems that we've seen on transit have to do with a lack of, or a loss of social norms. And that's a lot about who's riding and who's not riding. And I'll just tell you, you get, a, you get enough of, of, of bike weirdos riding transit and it will change for the better the culture on the trains and the, and the buses. So it'll increase, I think it, it could increase ridership, but I think it will also change the, the, the tenor of, of the atmosphere on some of these on some of these public transit. So anyway, just a thought. I'll share it on the survey as well. Thank you, Thank you Member Martinson. Uh, Member Koski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a quick question about your communication or relationship with Minneapolis Public Schools. So I represent a city council member here in Minneapolis, and I know a huge concern is that you know, our Minneapolis public school students that go to high school, they use uh, public transit to get to school, but I know that because of the decrease in, um, you know, routes, so I'm just wondering what that looks like when you're considering uh, 
how you're going to be uh, changing or altering routes and are you taking into consideration our high school students? Yeah, ditto in St. Paul, by the way. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, so two things here, Madam Chair, uh, member. Yes, we provide high school transportation in Minneapolis. Over the past couple of years, we've worked closely with them to figure out what the population at each school is and where the predominance of students are. So we continue to provide that service and we will continue to provide that service and it's really a need-based capacity question for us. Do we have the capacity? Do they need more? Can we provide it? So there's some schools that there'll be more students riding, so we'll need to put an extra bus out just to manage the capacity. So we'll do that. And we're in a position now to respond to those things as we start to get more operators on board. Uh, in St. Paul, we've been able to help St. Paul public schools over the last couple of years because they had the same problem we did for a while, which is they couldn't get bus operators to run their school bus. So we're continuing to partner with them as well. Excellent. Thank you for a great presentation. We are over time. Uh, I would just add one other comment. I know we had a snow emergency and we suddenly stopped all transit routes, uh, but there was no notification to partners like schools who suddenly had kids and they hadn't canceled school, but they had kids who couldn't get to school. So just a note to please let your partners know if we're going to be partners, let's be partners. Yeah, we've had a lot of post ice storm <laughs> conversations about who tells who what first. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that. Um, thank you all for uh, like, staying long. This is a great conversation. Remember, April will go long as well, so plan your schedules accordingly. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>